Yes, I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm Batman, Alfred. I'm Batman. I am Batman! I'm Batman. I'm Batman. Greetings, Bat Family. Welcome back to Holy Batcast, brought to you by Real Fans for Real Movies. Please visit our website, holybatcast.com. It is your one-stop shop for all things Holy Batcast. But you can also find us all over the internet on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube. Just search for Holy Batcast and you will find us. Uh, and we are also on Patreon. So if you love the show, you want to help support the show, you can do that on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash holybatcast. And as always, got to give a big old thank you to our newest patron. His name is Lee Ankrit. And I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, so yeah, Lee, uh, he also sent a very nice message along with his, his Patreon pledge, um, basically saying he just found us. And he's like, I just found you guys, and so I went, went back, and I'm listening to old episodes, and so I had to, you know, I had to help. Um, which, it's crazy to me that we've been doing this, oh my god, what is it now, 30 years, 35 years, something like that. That's what it feels like, is how long we've been doing this show. And that people still randomly find us, which is kind of cool. So welcome to the family, Lee. Uh, we do appreciate it. And uh, again, yeah, we all of our patrons, you guys are awesome. Thank you all for for what you do, for for helping us, you know, keep, keep this stuff paid for uh, so we can keep doing the show. So thank you. Um, what else? We're part of the Real Fans Podcast Network, so if you're looking for other shows to enjoy, you can check those out at rf4rm.com. Lots of fun nerdy stuff there. If you love Friday the 13th, uh, me and Hunter and Guy just did a fun little retrospective of the whole Friday the 13th franchise on the Real Fans show, which was super fun. So check that out if you if you feel like it, if you need more to listen to. Uh, and as always, I'm Andy DiGenova. You can follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. It's just my name, Andy DiGenova. Now this episode, we got a little bit of news to discuss, uh, but the big, the main topic here is that we're going to talk about the Joker 80th anniversary special that was released a month or two ago, something like that, re re released recently. We'll say that because I don't even remember when it was, but it was something we've been meaning to talk about, and this week we needed a topic, so we're like, hey. Let's celebrate 80 years of the Joker. Uh, and joining me for that, first of all, it is my bat brother from down under. It's Brendan Lowe. Hey, Brendan. Hey, how you doing? Great. How are you? I'm good. Very good. We haven't actually done this for almost two weeks, which is a long time for us. I know. Are you okay? Actually, it's been over two weeks. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, Absol good. You know. I need to I need to miss you to you know to appreciate you even more. And you know what? It's it's true. And and how can you miss me if I won't go away? It's exactly right. <laughs> uh, and well, we had to get Jamie back because I was able to make that happen. But guess what? He's gone again. Yes. Like the wind, just like a puff of smoke. Away he goes. But he'll be back. Of course he will. Um, and we have a very special guest joining us for this episode. So we just talked about Patreon. And uh, some of our patrons, you know, one of the one of the rewards is to come get a guest spot on the show. And uh, I actually, first of all, I should say this to anybody who's listening who's like, hey, I, I pledged and I'm supposed to get a guest spot. I actually have a bit of a long list that I'm trying to get through. So if I haven't gotten to you yet, it's not that I've forgotten you. I just have to work on it. So um, I'm checking one off the list today. Uh, and that is our, he's been like an old friend of the show for years now, but he made it official. Um, it is Jim Scroggs. Hey, Jim. Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Great. Welcome to Holy Batcast. I am incredibly happy to be here. <laughs> we are incredibly happy to have you. And yeah, like when, uh, when you became a patron, I was like, oh, Jim, like, I mean, cause you, you've been very just supportive and interactive on Twitter for years now. So, uh, it's nice to, I guess, finally actually talk to you and, and hear what you sound like as opposed to just Twitter. Yeah. I knew the name straight away. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure in your head or someone said it was a bunch of ones and zeros, <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. It's good. Um, it's your first time. So, um, we'll be gentle. Well, I will. I can't speak for Brendan. <laughs> I'm a bit more rambunctious. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Uh, but as is tradition, you've got to tell us, uh, tell us, you know, a little bit about your your Batman fandom, your favorite Batman movie, and why. 
Well, I mean, I like to think my Batman fandom has been going fairly strong for, see, what, about 30 years now. I mean, I've, I obviously remember when 89 came out and how big of a deal that was. I don't necessarily... It took me a while after that to see the movie because I was like seven and trying to convince my mom to do that was like pulling teeth. But, you know, if, if you've kind of, if you follow me on Twitter, I may have kind of revealed what my favorite uh, Batman film is. And I believe, Andy, I sent you a picture of a pack of cards that also may have revealed that a few months ago when we, I think we were in Orlando at the same time. Oh. It's, yeah, it is Batman Returns. Nice. I like it. I appreciate it. Was, it. <laughs> it was the first a movie I saw in the theater. You know, obviously Keaton's my favorite Batman. Um, a few years ago, I was at a Atlanta Braves baseball game playing the Pittsburgh Pirates, and he was there. They showed him on the video <gasps> board. I stood straight up. Oh wow! And I said under my breath. At least I thought it was under my breath. I may have been a little bit too loud because I was just like, "Oh my God, this is fantastic!" I straight up said, "It's Batman." <laughs> <laughs> It 100% is. Um, yeah. Okay. I've never told this story before, but I'm going to tell it to you because you just made me think of it, talking about how Michael Keaton was your favorite and you were in like the same vicinity as him. Um, when Batman 89 came out, you know, that was when I became fully obsessed with Batman. And so I bought anything I could that had a Bat logo on it, right? And one of those things was a Batman flashlight, but the flashlight was not just light. It was the Bat signal. So it was like a little mini bat signal flashlight. And I was 10 years old. And I was like, when I got it, I was in the car and I were riding home and it was nighttime. And I was like, oh, as soon as I get out of the car, I'm going to turn this on and I'm going to flash it up into the sky and it's going to look like the bat signal. And then in my child brain, I was like, and what if Michael Keaton sees it and he comes <laughs> to it? <laughs> And he stands up really slowly and gazes out the window. And I had convinced myself that if I shine this up, Michael Keaton will see it and he will come and we will become friends. <laughs> and so I get out of the car and I get the batteries and the flashlight and I stand outside and it's dark and I shine it up into the sky and I got some really bad news for you guys. It did not look anything like the bat signal. It just disappeared into the darkness and I was like, Oh, but for a minute, I had this wonderful hope that this was my key to becoming friends with Michael Keaton. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so my point is at the baseball game, you should have done that. Like you should have somehow gotten on the on the big screen and showed a Batman shirt. And then he would come find you and be like, I love your shirt. And you'd be like, I know, let's hang out. And then he could join us on this episode. Exactly. And if you know anything about baseball dimensions, like I was kind of by the uh, left, uh, right field foul pole. And so I guess he was behind the plate. So doing math in my head that I'm horrible at, I was at least within 500 feet of him. Mm, so so that's, close. that's pretty cool. Yeah. You just send him a beer or something. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'd be like, hi, usher person. Uh, Michael <laughs> Keaton's down there. Send this to him. Yes. Um, but one one quick thing I wanted to mention about returns, and I'm like, even though like the performances by Pfeiffer, DeVito, Keaton Walker, they're they're fantastic. And as much as I love sequences like you know the the turn, if you will, of uh, Selena in a Catwoman, and the you know and the mistletoe scene, my favorite line delivery is by Andrew uh, Bertiarski when Max Shrek gets kidnapped, and it's basically him just doing a bad Christopher Walken impression. <laughs> it's terrible. And by I've terrible, always, you mean awesome. Yeah, I've always thought that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> Dad, no, wait. Yeah. Um, Chip Shrek is, is the unsung hero of that film, without a doubt. I want, I want Max and Chip brought into comics continuity, and I want it now. <laughs> I was going to say, with you shining your flashlight, I'm surprised that Chris from hey, do you remember, didn't show up as Kid Batman. Like, I'm surely the torch would have had, you know, would I know. have been able to get his attention. You Maybe not Michael Keaton, but... You don't understand how many of those stories that Chris tells, and I go, yep, me too. Yeah. It's... <laughs> like, I, I definitely was in the construction phase of my own Bat costume because I was going to go fight crime 
in Lockport, Illinois. 100%. So anyway, <laughs> um, Batman Returns, your favorite. I love it. That's awesome. Um, and yep, I agree. Chip Shrek, he is, uh, he is unappreciated in his time. And then he grew up to be Leatherface. So once his dad died, that's what happened to him. I think he was in Pearl Harbor or something, too, from memory. Was he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I only ever saw Pearl Harbor once, and I don't remember, but I, I believe you. That sounds about right. He, he was uh, Latimer in the program, if anyone else saw that movie. Ah, okay. All right. Well, very cool, Jim. Thank you for sharing, and again, welcome to the show. Um, before we get to the Joker, though, we got a couple little pieces of news. The first piece of news here, um, it's not about a Batman movie, but it is about a DC movie, and that is Black Adam. So Black Adam is um, gearing up and seems like they're, you know, if, if the world will allow it, they're going to shoot uh, early next year, I think. And so... We know that we've got DC Fandom coming up, but we still are getting little bits of news leading up to it, and I don't know why that is. I don't know if that's just because they can't keep it quiet, or, you know, we're still a month away from Fandom, so they're like, ah, we don't want to wait that long. But anyway, um, the news is this, is that actor Noah Centineo uh, has been cast in Black Adam as Adam Smasher, as part of the Justice Society. So... This guy, I don't really know him other than that I know his name has been thrown around a lot for other things, most specifically He-Man. So oh. I have no strong opinions on him as an actor other than like he seems like he gets rumored for other geeky things. Um, and so I know we had heard that Adam Smasher was going to be in Black Adam because there's going to be, you know, a Justice Society presence in there. Um, we also heard Hawkman, Hawkgirl, Dr. Fate are supposed to pop up in that movie too, which all very exciting. But now we have an Adam Smasher. So, um, Brendan, what do you think? Yeah, I'm down. Like, uh, Black Adam's still one of those movies where I'm like, really? Like, we, we, like that yeah. character, we're getting a Black Adam movie? That's crazy to me. But... You know, when The Rock says he wants to do a Black Adam movie, you say, okay, cool. Um, so, I mean, look, anything that comes out of the making of this, I'm just going to roll with the punches and go, okay, yeah, cool. I mean, I'm going to go check it out. So, whatever happens, happens. The All more right. DC characters, the better. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, Jim, how are you feeling about this? I've seen him in some Netflix movies to all the boys I loved before and another one I believe I can't remember the name of it right now, but I mean seems fine. I full confession know absolutely nothing about Adam Smasher, but sure. <laughs> yeah. My knowledge of Adam Smasher pretty much comes from Justice League Unlimited. Yeah, same. He would just pop up sort of in in cameos but i think that he's essentially like a male giganta which means he can just grow really big yeah is my is my knowledge of him but you're right like i'm trying to think if i've ever read a comic book that featured adam smasher and if so i can't think of one but i do love the idea of like i'm kind of where brendan is is like i like black adam but i just never thought black adam would have a movie or even should have a movie um but the fact that they're bringing in other parts of the DC universe into the movie makes me a lot more excited about it. And so, yeah, like Adam Smasher probably ain't going to get a movie. And uh, so, like, yeah, that's kind of fun. And as for yeah, as far as the actor, again, like, sure, you know, I, I have no strong opinion about him, but great, you know, fine with me. It's so funny because I always I don't know if I've said this on this show or not, like when there was talk of a Shazam movie, you know, years ago. I always thought The Rock would be great as Shazam. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, now I can't imagine anyone else other than Zach Levi, but the whole premise of, you know, a kid turning into The Rock, essentially, I thought that would be very appealing and funny. And even though, yeah, he kind of looks like Black Adam, you could still play him off as Shazam. Like, it wouldn't matter. But, you know, we, we kind of got that with the Jumanji reboot now is, is, you know, like a kid turning into the rock. So mm -hmm. it, it, it could have worked and I still think it would have been really funny and, you know, but again, I just, I loved Zach Levi in that role. I can't imagine anyone else now, but again, it's the rock who he sells tickets. So I can understand why they're doing it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. So, all right. Well, great. Noah Centineo. Welcome to the DC universe. Good to have you. Be awesome. 
we support you. Um, the other bit, bit of news that came out, uh, it has to do more with Batman, more specifically the Batman. So I know that the Batman, it is, uh, it is, if it hasn't started re, it, if it hasn't started shooting again, it's, it's like days away from starting to reshoot or not reshoot, but to start shooting again. Um, yeah. And they're moving indoors too. Yeah. So that was, that was a little bit of news is that like, they can't really do it on location because of COVID. So they're going to have to do most of it in sound stages and stuff. And I saw a little bit of like murmurs and, and concern about that online. Like some, honestly, it was kind of half and half. Some people were like, Oh yeah, cool. You know, that makes sense. And other people were like, Oh, it's not going to be the same. And, um, you know, I, the way I look at it is, I mean, yeah, you're both right. Like it's not going to be the same, but it is what it is. You know, if your option is to get the Batman movie, but, where the cast and crew can be safe and you know if that means moving indoors i'm like so be it that's fine um because it's better than not having the movie and it's better than anyone getting sick so i i support it and i get it, it makes sense to me um and i also i feel like i have enough faith in matt reeves as a filmmaker as i feel like he'll know how to shoot that stuff that you probably won't even know the difference yeah that's what i think um, but it seems like Matt Reeves's Batman or Matt Reeves's Gotham, we will not only see it in the Batman because uh, they announced that there will be a Gotham Police Department or a Gotham Central series, uh, and it was on HBO Max, right? Yep. Yeah, I thought it was an HBO Max thing. Um, that is from the world of his The Batman. So. We're getting essentially that Gotham Central series that a lot of people wanted when Gotham was announced. So, uh, Jim, how do you feel about this news? I'm on board. I really am into continuity in terms of universes and all that. So I definitely want to see not, not necessarily a proper Gotham Central show, but something that would maybe stay in line rather than what Gotham was. For the most part, I enjoyed Gotham like the first two seasons. Then it just kind of got a little bit too wonky for me. But yeah, I definitely trust Mac Reeves, like you said. And I think if they focus on the, I guess, corruption of what the Gotham City Police Department is, because that's basically the root of it. There's really only one good cop, and that's Commissioner Gordon. I think if they focus on that... I think that could be very uh, beneficial and could lead to better uh, better storytelling. Awesome. All right, Brendan, what about you? Yeah, look, I'm on board. Um, I, I haven't read them for years, but I read at least the first three trades of Gotham Central, um, and I loved it. I thought it was really, really good. And I remember when Gotham was announced, that, that was kind of the show they – they pitched to everyone at announcement. It, it very much sounded like it was going to be that Gotham central style show. And then for whatever reason, they kind of pivoted in the development of it, but I'm, I'm completely down being HBO max. It's going to be very cinematic. Um, it'll have a decent budget, you know, particularly like star power as well. Um, Jeffrey Wright has got a, a history with HBO as well. I mean, so there's a chance he could be involved, you know, whether he's on the show permanently or, you know, reoccurring, you never know. But Yeah, I think I, they I, did I, say he was going to be Gordon in the show, but it was unclear if it was like if he was going to be the lead of the show or if he was just going to pop up here and there. Like, it, th to me, that wasn't clear, but it did sound it sounds like he will be in, in it. Yeah. And like you can you can flesh out some of the characters that, you know, like I, I'd love to see a big screen Harvey Bullock. Um, I'd love for that to happen. So you could flesh that character out a bit. You could bring in Harvey Dent potentially um, into that show. But I I do think it will be the sort of thing where, you know, it's going to be set in the same universe, but I, I don't imagine it's going to be compulsory viewing. You know, it'll, it'll add to the universe. It'll expand things. But for the general audience, it, it won't matter if you haven't seen the series, you know, in between films or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with both of you guys. I think it sounds really cool. Like, I love the idea of expanding the universe in this way. Um, I like being able to get additional content in Gotham City, in a Gotham City that we know from the movies, in between movies. I think that's really cool. I love that it's going to have our, our Gordon in it one way or the other. So 
I think it sounds very promising, and I love the idea of, again, expanding Matt Reeves' version of Gotham in this way. Um, I'll be very curious to see, like, what road it goes down. Like, is it going to be more Law & Order, or is it going to be more Gotham? Is it going to be somewhere in the middle? Like, how much are they going to dive into the bigger pieces of the Batman mythology? You know, like... Will the, you know? Will the villains pop up? Will the court of owls pop up? Are they going to try and stick it very street level, cops and robbers, and it just happens to be in Gotham? That's what I'm curious about: is seeing how much of of Batman's world they're going to delve into, um, or if they're going to try and keep it a lot more, again, subtle and, and street level. So we shall see. But I think it sounds really cool. I love that idea, and you know, it's a great way to get more eyeballs on HBO Max. Um, so I'm excited about it. You know, more content is, is great. Um, it's funny, though, because I saw a little bit of, like, cynicism about it online of, like, oh, do you see going back to the Batman well? Why can't we get something that's not Batman? And I was like, um, please go to DC Universe and enjoy Stargirl and Titans and Doom Patrol. Like, like there's... Not to mention the Switch CW shows. Right, like, there's tons of non-Batman content. Like, and this being tied in with the new big Batman movie is actually really cool. So I just I just love the people who, who look the gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm into it. I think it sounds cool, um, and I'm excited to hear and see more. Um, and it'll just be interesting, yeah, to see, like, how much Matt Reeves is involved, how much uh, Jeffrey Wright's involved. Like, yeah, like... Where will those connections be made? Um, it does seem, though, as if it will take place, like, after the events of the movie, is the way I'm reading it, because it seems like it will be more like the current Gotham PD as opposed to Gotham, the show, which took place before Batman. So this will be during Batman as opposed to before Batman, which I think is awesome. Yeah. And that's what made the comic series interesting, too, is seeing, you know, how the cops in Gotham, you know, in a city where there is a Batman, how do they deal... A with crimes when he's not involved. Like, they still have to do their jobs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I said, it's been years since I've read it. I really want to get back into them, actually, and, and read the whole lot. But, yeah, it's a really cool premise. Maybe every episode will be sort of like a version of Batman 66 where Commissioner Gordon and Chief O'Hara just sort of look at each other and they're like, well, we're not up for it. We'd better call Batman. <laughs> I think it's one of the very first episodes. It's so funny where Commissioner's like, well, <laughs> well, the Riddler is here. Who's up for it? Who's ready to take on the, you know, the Prince of Puzzles? Anyone? You? Chief O'Hara? You? And Chief O'Hara's like, we're all too proud to admit it, but we should call Batman. <laughs> 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 they right, they all give up. That's, that's going to be the show. That's going to be Gotham Central. Every episode is them standing around the same room going, just let Batman deal with it. I'd still watch it. <laughs> Me too. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Gotham Central or whatever it's going to end up being called. I think that's cool. It's, it's exciting. So very neat. Um, so always fun to get more content set in Gotham City. Um, but some of the citizens of Gotham City have uh, reached a milestone age this year. And it's funny because uh, a few months ago, we had the Robin 80th anniversary special. So we talked about Robin and celebrated 80 years of Robin. Well... Now it's Joker's turn, and then we still have Catwoman. So because we're doing Joker, we have to make sure that we make time for Catwoman too, because, yeah, three big milestone characters in Batman's world all turned 80 this year, and we got to celebrate them all. So we did Robin, but it's Joker's turn. So, uh, yeah, uh, we had been meaning to talk about it. Again, it's been out for, again, I think two months, something like that. But the Joker 80th anniversary special. So uh, we've all done our reading, and without further ado, let's dive into uh, Joker's 80th anniversary. Pull up my little my little iPad here so I can see what the heck we're talking about. All right. Good. I'm doing the same thing. <laughs> yep, let's see. I've got a physical copy. <laughs> oh, my God. Old lady. What the hell? Okay. <laughs> no, I would buy a physical copy. Copy. A copy. Copy. Poppity. Uh, you could, I would buy a physical copy if I could find one in China, but I can't. So digital it is. Um, yeah. I got but, the Leap of Mayho cover. Yeah, I was going to say, this is another one of those that probably had like 100 covers like Robin. Um, yeah, it did. So, but I just got, the, I guess, the standard cover that it's, uh, it looks like it's the, I think it's Greg Capullo is the standard cover that I got on the digital one. 
Yep, cover by Greg Capullo and Fico Placentia. Mm, all right. So, yep, guys, uh, if you are out there, the one we are talking about is the Joker 80th Anniversary. It says 100-page super spectacular. And uh, right there, it says all new tales of the Clown Prince of Crime. So this is one of those specials that we've gotten a few times now where it's... Um, a bunch of little short stories about the subject matter done by all stars uh, within the genre of comic book writers and artists. So this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, yeah, ten. Ten, ten stories as well as a bunch of other random cool artwork and stuff inside. Um, and so I guess we'll, we'll, we'll start just overall impressions on the special and then we will, you know, go, go story by story kind of briefly and say what we thought of each one. Um, but I guess we'll give a spoiler warning if you really don't want to be spoiled. But, I mean, I think you'll be all right. Um, we'll still do it, just to be safe. So, yeah, just overall thoughts of this uh, 80th anniversary special. Brendan. It's good. Um, I I don't want to sort of... I know we'll give a wrap-up at the end, but to me, overall, it's a little bit more miss than hit. Um, there's a couple of stories in there that I, I genuinely really like. There's some that are a bit so-so, and there's a couple that I'm just... They didn't appeal to me at all. Um, I guess, spoiler alert for the Catwoman book, when we get to it, I I liked it more, which I think... I read this first, and I, I dug it, and then I read the Catwoman one, and was like, that's actually kind of better than the Joker one. Um, like, I really like what they did with it. But it's, it's similar to the Robin one. Um, I didn't love it as much as I would have liked to have, but the stories that I do like, I, I do really like. They're very good. Nice. I haven't read the Catwoman yet because uh, I was waiting for us to do it. But I guess I could probably do what I did with this one. Is just, I read it when it came out and then sort of forgot all about it until we were going to do this. And then I was like, uh, I reread it and I went, oh, yeah, that's right. So I, it's nice to hear that you like Catwoman even more because that makes me excited to read it. Um, they seem to go, they went sort of chronologically with Catwoman. Oh, like, that's it fun. seems to be a story from every decade, mm -hmm. which I really liked that approach to it. And I'm kind of like, why didn't I do that with this? Like, that would have been really cool to see, you know, like your Golden Age and Silver Age Joker and that kind of stuff and all the way through. But no, I mean, it, again, it is what it is. And I, it just, some, yeah, for me, it was a little bit more missed than hit, but I still liked it. Okay, cool. Jim, what about you? Yeah, I kind of echo Brendan's sentiments, sentiments a little bit. Um, I, I probably go a little bit inconsistent, if you will, but for the most part, it's a it's a decent it's a decent read. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think we're all kind of on the same page. Uh, I I feel like it's a little more hit than miss. I think. Um, Ooh, conflict. I know. Let's fight. <laughs> uh but because it's funny because yeah i read it on its own and honestly there's something there was something there's something kind of freeing about reading it and not and knowing you don't have to worry about a podcast right away because then you can just read it and enjoy it which yeah i don't do that anymore to anything <laughs> if i'm reading or watching something it tends to be for a podcast so i'm like oh great i'm just gonna read it um but yeah like very little of it stayed with me there was honestly there was only one story that i could recall before i reread it um, and I'll tell you which one it is when we get into it. Um, there was only one that really stood out, and I, I think it's probably my favorite one because it was the one that stood out. Um, but then when I reread it yesterday, I went, "Oh God! Like I like this better than I remember. I think I, I think this is better than I remembered." But then somewhere in the middle was when I went, "Oh, okay. Like okay, now it's starting to sag a bit." So I feel like you know, like many things, it starts strong, and I think it ends strong. Um, more or less. Um, but yeah, it's it, like all of these, I think because yeah, you get a bunch of short stories. Some are going to appeal to you more than others. Some are going to be better than others. Um, and that's just the nature of it. But I, it is just fun to see the character represented through a lot of different lenses all in one place. I think that's a lot of fun just to see how versatile the character has become over 80 years. So I think that's kind of neat. But yeah, I think for me, um, like you guys said, yeah, it's, it's a fun read. It, I enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, certain, certain stories, I just was like, oh, okay, I guess. And then certain stories, I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's really cool. So um, yeah. 
But we will go and just sort of give our thoughts uh, story by story. Um, and so we'll go with the first one here. The first one, oh, I guess so this is your spoiler warning. So if you don't want to be spoiled, jump ahead. But I don't know. It's There's nothing that's, I think, super spoilery that you should even worry about, personally. I mean, they're Joker stories, but... Anyway, they're kind of interesting. Uh, all right, so the very first one is called Scars. It's written by Scott Snyder. Artist is Jock. Colors by David Barron. And letters by Tom Napolitano. Um, and this one, it is like a doctor who... Uh, he tells this story about, like, a, you know, his, his family. They did animal hides and they made him a flower out of animal hides and he was so freaked out about it and he threw it away um but anyway he he works with victims of the joker and he's working with one in particular and explaining that like the joker's power is that he makes his victims think he's more than he is like that he's some sort of supernatural being and he knows exactly how to uh play on their greatest fears but that's not it at all the joker's just a man he's just a person like anyone else and He's just very good at manipulating people into thinking that he's after them where he doesn't care about them. But basically all these victims, they're afraid to heal because they think that if they heal, the Joker's going to come back for them. Uh, and so like, just it's, it's not just about the physical scars, but it's about how they're scarred inside. And this doctor's like, you can't give the Joker this power. He's just a person. And he doesn't even care about you. Like This is, this is not about you know, this is not about you. You just, you just were unlucky, but you think that he was after you. And so basically he's like, oh, you know, I'm trying to work with these. And we find out he's being funded by the Wayne foundation. Um, and he's like, yeah, this is what I'm doing. But the Joker, he's nothing to be afraid of. It's okay. Heal. Um, and so then he goes to bed and, uh, the Joker leaves this fleshy flower for him. It sprays him in the face and melts his face. And then the Joker is under his bed. Um, so I will say, I guess before we start, is this one, this is the one I remembered. And I don't know if I remembered it because it was the first one, because I'm, you know, that's the way the memory works, is you always remember the beginning and the end. You don't always remember the middle. Um, but this is the only one that stood out to me after I read it the first time, um, because I think it's really damn scary. Uh, but maybe that's just me. Um, Jim, what did you think of Scars? I definitely agree with you with the scary part. Because I believe I believe in the story, the doctor says something about the monster under the bed when he's literally under the bed. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. You're right. This is one of maybe three that probably like, oh, yeah, I just stood out. I liked him. I like reading them. I really liked the artwork. I liked how whenever I think of the Joker, you have that literally like ear to ear grin and like he's enjoying all of this. And I, I like the the use of the like, use of the word scars like the title is very is very appropriate because you're right he he's joker seems like he's crazy but he is a actual genius who knows exactly what he's doing and so i the way that this doctor described him diagnosed him whatever you want to call it really basically hit home the fact that oh this is almost a complete perfect description of the joker mm -hmm. yeah brendan what do you think yeah, this is one of the ones that I liked. Definitely freaky, um, but I, I did like how it took a different approach. I mean, it was a Joker story without really featuring the Joker. Mm -hmm. you know, it's only in that last panel, but I just hearing and seeing the imagery of, you know, what he's done to other people. And and as we know, too, I mean, he, he does it for shits and giggles. Like, there's no logic to it or anything. Um, but, yeah, it was definitely freaky. Like, I liked the... Like the um, almost like the, the braces, like the heads, the mask thing that this guy has to wear because of what the joke has done to him. Like, it's scary looking. So it's, yeah, I, I this was one that I did like. Yeah, yeah, it, it is interesting that, like, it's sort of, and I think this is something Scott Snyder does really well as a writer, is that he is telling a Joker story about an aspect of the Joker that we know ever dive into which is the after effects of people who've been attacked by the joker like you you read so many comics where the joker yeah like 
the Joker poisons or gasses people or cuts them up or messes with them, and you leave the victim there. But for the victims that survive, you never really go, well, what happens to them? Do they get better? Can they get better? What, what happens? And I like that Scott Snyder's like, oh, yeah, no one's ever talked about that. I'll make that the story. And I think that's actually a really interesting angle. Um, I agree that I think the artwork is really strong in this, especially at the end when the doctor gets the spray uh, on the on his face, the acid, because it's so creepy and gross. Um, and, yeah, the image of the Joker under the bed is is just nightmare fuel. So, yeah, I thought this was really clever. You know, it gets a little wordy, but that's also a Scott Snyder thing as he... he <laughs> he's a writer in the purest sense. He just writes and writes and writes. <laughs> um, mm. And so, that, yeah, it's it's very verbose, but that's his style. Um, but I think it's really interesting, and I think it's really creative, and, and I like it. And I do like that it's like this guy is going, ah, the Joker, he's just a man. He doesn't single you out. And the, he says, oh, there's a certain point where, like, oh, yeah, I actually saw him in traction at the hospital. And, I, and, and it's implied that the Joker noticed him and was like, oh, Okay, when I get out, that dude needs to be taught a lesson. So, yeah, I really like this one. I thought it was it was clever, it was interesting, it was scary. So, I dig it. Um, as I said, between all the different stories, though, there's there's uh, classic covers that feature the Joker, and there are also uh, there's also some like new artwork and stuff. So, I always like when there's like supplemental material to these specials where you get all this extra stuff. I think that's really cool. Um, all right, next story up is called What Comes at the End of a Joke. And and what does come at the end of a joke, guys? Uh, laughs, if you're good at telling them. Right, right. What what provides the laughs, though? A character that I've heard about but have never read anything on before. Well, now you learn. So the, a punchline comes at the end of a joke. A punchline. Um this one is written by James Tyne in the fourth. Artist is Mikkel Janine. Uh, I, I'm sorry if I'm saying these names wrong. Um, colors by Jordi Belair and letters by Clayton Cowles. And so this one, it's like uh, it's Snyder College, probably a nod to Scott Snyder, who is James Tynan's like mentor. Um, and so at Snyder College, it's like dress like your hero day, and some you know, troublemaking gal dresses up like the Joker. Everyone else dresses up like the Flash and Wonder Woman and Green Lantern. But not this gal. She dresses like the Joker. And so the dean comes to talk to her and is like, that's not cool. You knew you're starting trouble. It's dress like a hero. You don't dress like the Joker. And she goes on this big diatribe about like, oh, please, like, you know, you tell us we can be whatever we want, but guess what? Some of us don't want to be a hero. Some of us want to be the bad guy. So guess what? And so she blows smoke in his face, and it has an effect on him. It's like some sort of Joker toxin. And she goes, yeah, I found the recipe online. And I've had a great teacher. And so she's telling kind of her, uh, her worldview as she is putting on makeup and changing. And what essentially we get is the almost the origin story of Punchline, who is the Joker's new girlfriend slash partner in the main Batman book. She did have like a, a pretty big, to your point, Brendan, like a pretty big debut uh, a month or two ago in that like, yeah, Punchline. She's this new character that James Tynan has created for the book. And this gives us just a little more info on who she is, what she wants, what she's from. And it fi we find out that she's doing this whole thing and killing this Dean uh, to prove herself to the Joker that she is serious and he's there and he's watching and so she's like all right well then away we go so the two of them she's proved herself she's become the Joker's partner and uh, this one then will be continued in Joker War which is the main storyline in the Batman book so thoughts on this one Jim it was fine uh kind of I like the artwork the writing you know once I read it a second time it seemed to flow a little better Mm -hmm. for me uh to be fair i have never heard of punchline so that's where some of my comic knowledge is 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 lacking there but the, the, i did like the idea of you're right you know these teachers and uh, people say yeah you can be whatever you want to be but you don't expect someone to say oh i want to be kind of cause terror i want to be the bad guy so that's just some you know as humans as people we're not necessarily prepared to hear because we always think oh you're right i want to be 
I want to do good. I want to be the Flash. I want to be Green Lantern and all that. So from that aspect of it, the second time I ran through of it, I was like, okay, you know, that's that's I, I'm feeling this a little bit a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you, Brendan? Yeah, this one didn't do much for me. Um, like I, I'd, I'd heard of Punchline, but obviously, like I said, I'd never read anything about her. Um, this. I mean, this is kind of like a prelude, I guess, to, you know, the, the Joker War that, that began in the regular, the monthly comics, which listeners of this show know that I haven't read in several years now, coming up to four, three and a half, four years. Um, and this didn't do anything to make me want to jump back in. Like, it didn't grab me. I, I didn't really care. <laughs> that might sound a bit cruel. Um, but, I mean, like, it was, it was a little self-contained thing. Like, I get it. But, yeah, it didn't didn't really do much for me yeah i think that this works best if you are reading the current book and you're current on it because yeah Yeah. over the past few issues they've introduced punchline she had a fight with harley that was really cool like i love the idea of this new character and i think that's what james tynan's doing so well in the book is that and I've, i've said it before where he is he's definitely playing with all the classic characters and the classic rogues gallery but he's trying to add new elements as he goes like he's really trying to make his stamp on batman's world without betraying the pre-existing parts of Batman's world, which is a tough balancing act, but I think he's doing it very well. And so, yeah, like he's got Harley as a main character, but then he's introducing Punchline and he's letting these two come to blows. So if you're current on the book and you're like, Punchline, where, you know, where did she come from? I want to know more. This works if you want to know more. But if all you've done is you've seen the image online and go, oh, that's the Joker's new girlfriend and that's all you know, then yeah, I could see this not working as well because it's just not as important to you. This is a very of-the-moment story as opposed to like a, you know, for the people who just picked up the Joker special but haven't been reading the book, they'd go, wait, what? Like, you know, so I get that, but I enjoyed it because I think Punchline is a very cool new character. I love her design. Um, She's not Harley in that she's not silly. She's just evil. Um so she's not having fun the way Harley's having fun. She's, you know, she kind of speaks more to the sadistic side of the Joker. Um, so yeah, as like a little mini origin for her, I thought it works well, but you have to be interested in her. So, yeah. yeah. All right, well, there you go. Uh, and uh, on to Joker War. But, I, you know, I said it before, I'll say it again. If you're not reading Tynan's Run, I'd recommend it. I'm really enjoying it. It's really good. Um... The next one up is called Kill the Batman. Uh, This one was written by Gary Witta and Greg Miller. Uh, Artist is Dan Mora. Colors by Ivan Placentia. And letters by Troy Petiri. Um, So this one, it's called Kill the Batman. But I will call it Easter Egg City. Or, it literally is. I, lo- or, I loved it. Or Easter Sunday, maybe. That's what we can call it, because there's Easter <laughs> eggs everywhere. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is just Easter Egg City, but that's fun. Um, but in this story, Batman has been killed. The Joker has killed Batman. And so this is taking place a few days after the death of Batman and after Batman has died, Alfred announces to the world that it was actually Bruce Wayne. Bruce Wayne was Batman and he he basically said, you know, the world should know everything that Bruce and and Batman have done for us. Um, You know, so many people saw him as this carefree playboy but that's not who he was he gave everything to try and help gotham and i want everyone to know it so it's essentially gotham's citywide funeral for bruce wayne and batman so you see the bat cave and you hear uh commissioner gordon give a eulogy you hear superman give a you a, a, you know not a eulogy but thoughts wonder woman does the same there's like a big citywide celebration of bruce and batman's life And the whole time, Joker is, like, watching this, and he's like, what the hell? You know, I kill this guy, and they're all celebrating him. How is it that he's a hero, but I'm a villain, but we're both crazy? Like, what the hell? And then Joker, as he's going, he realizes, oh, man, like, I killed Batman. Now I don't know what to do. Like, that that was my whole thing. Like, without him, what should I do? Uh, He's got no meaning anymore. He's like, I need to find another way to make people miserable and if i don't have the batman to do it i need to find another way to do it 
So I need a career change. And the gag at the end is that he gets a job at the DMV. Because <laughs> that's where he can go to make people miserable. Um, but as we said, there are a million Easter eggs in this thing from just from within the artwork, like in the Batcave and around Gotham. But a lot of the dialogue is very Easter eggy. There's a lot of um, lines from different Batman movies. There are nods to different Batman movies. There are nods to at least every live action. Well, maybe not Batfleck. I'm trying to think. There's not really one that I can think of that was Batfleck, but they definitely have references to Batman 66, uh, to Keaton, Kilmer, and Clooney, and to Christian Bale. So they try to hit it from all sides. Yeah, one of the Batmobiles in the Batcave is... Uh, is the Batman the Animated Series Batmobile. You can also see the Tumblr in there. Um, there's a Batman Beyond suit in the background. Yeah, it's weird. I, I, I'm trying to think of anything that was like BVS. My favorite is, I think my favorite's the um, Batman Returns costume. In yeah. The glass case. Yeah, no, there's a lot of like, they, they have all the costumes in the back and they, yeah, they all look awesome. And you're right, there's a Batman Returns one. Um, there's Batman like the. Batman Forever gets to mention, which is great. Yeah, there's like a well, and there's a little sign that's like Batman Forever with at the at the funeral. There's also a sign that's like the old Batman sixty six logo. They use the Batman yeah. Forever font for one of the the things. Yes, and then Joker's got the why so serious on his Smilex vest. Yep, yeah, he's he's got Smilex. Uh, Mister Freeze makes an ice pun, and the Joker goes, "Oh come on, Freeze, Dad jokes really." So, and Mister Freeze is definitely aesthetically the animated series mr freeze as well yeah but yeah there's there's great stuff in here so um yeah i mean brendan you already kind of chimed in but yeah thoughts on this one um this is one of my favorites um this is the one i was when i was reading it originally i messaged you and i'd only read the first two pages and the second i saw the keaton costume i was like have you read this yet that you there's a sec this um second story in here you sorry the third story you're gonna love there's you know an awesome Easter egg. And then as I kept going, I was like, actually dude, this whole thing is full of Easter eggs. Like every, you know, panel I looked at, it was like, Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. I, I had a lot of fun reading it. And I, and you know, I, I did sort of laugh to myself at the end. It's like, that's the DMV gag was, was really funny. I, I liked it. So th yeah, this is one of my highlights of the whole, the whole book. Awesome. Jim, what about you? This one was really fun. That's the first order that comes to mind because I'm looking through right now and I think I see a 66 cowl. Uh, looks like a, I mean, I think she's got red hair, but it, it kind of resembles Batgirl. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this one was really, this one's really cool. I like the premise, you know, because we've seen, you know, the death of major characters for the last five years, but this one just to see exactly how Joker would react if he actually got the job done huh you know he has to think about it yeah go to the dmv and i'm actually getting my license renewed in like a week and a half so fingers crossed i don't have to run to him <laughs> uh yeah i agree i mean i agree with you guys this one was so fun and yeah it's just a celebration of of the character uh especially in film um but yeah like the my only thing is i'm sitting here looking for any any reference that would be one for bvs and that's the only thing that i feel like is missing which is i think a bummer because everything else is represented in one way or the other i love it um and yeah it's super fun and it is one of those things where it's like yeah the joker wants nothing more but to kill batman but if he were to ever actually succeed in it he wouldn't know what to do with himself which is so true so i just i just think that's a, such a great angle for him um so yeah, this one is awesome. It's like a great what if, you know, what if the Joker succeeded and then what does that look like? But this one's this one's awesome. The artwork is great, like all of the different versions of, you know, what's in the Batcave and, and the suits and, and everyone looks great in this. So yeah, kudos all around. I feel like the statue that he walks past on the second last panel before the DMV reveal, like I feel like that is a um, like a famous you know, like Batman piece as well. I just can't place where it's from, mm -hmm. but I know I feel like I've definitely seen that before. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it looks similar. It almost looks like when McFarlane used to do Batman, how he would do yeah. the very angular and, and oversized cape. This isn't quite as extreme as what McFarlane did, but that's what it reminds me of. Mm, maybe it's that, but yeah, it's definitely a nod to something else. Yeah. But yeah, 
Oh, and then did you did you notice the Joker's name tag at the DMV? I was just Jack, reading oh, that. Oh, Jack N. Yeah. yeah, Jack N. So. Which, I mean, his disguise is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You never tell it's him. I don't know who that is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so uh, Kill the Batman this is, this is super fun. Um, all right, next one up is Introducing the Dove Corps. This one was written by Denny O'Neill. So I love that Denny O'Neill was able to write this before he passed on. Like, that's so cool. Yeah, is this his last story? I, I would know? think so. Unless, he, does he have one yeah. in the Catwoman special? Not to my memory, no. Okay, so yeah, if he doesn't have one in the Catwoman one, my guess is, yeah, this is probably his last one. Um, uh, artist Jose Luis Garcia. Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. It, cra- it drives me crazy. He gets you of, every time. He's one of my favorite <laughs> artists, but my God, that name. You're killing me. Um, Inker Joe Prado, colors Marcelo Maolo, and letters by Clem Robbins. Um, so here, the Joker, he's like bored of crime. So he joins the Peace Corps. <laughs> And he's like, yeah, I always take hostages. It'll be just fun. Nice change of pace to go to go help a hostage, go free a hostage. So he joins the Peace Corps, even though it's called the Dove Corps. And it's like this peaceful secret group that goes uh, overseas and, uh, you know, helps extract people, but completely non-lethal. Like they don't kill anyone, but he joins this group and he's freaking them out. And he's like, he's really disappointed that they don't kill anyone. And they're like, no, that's what we do is we, you know, we don't take a life and we go out there and we, we help these people. And they've got like an itching gun. So it shoots like itching powder. Um, and so with the Dove Corps, the Joker like helps them go in and defeat these bad guys and save the hostages. And everyone's like, oh my God, you did it. Thanks, man. Like, you're great. Welcome to the Dove Corps. And he's like, oh, thanks. That's awesome. Uh, but, and then he kills everyone anyway. So that is that one. Jim, what do you think of this one? I didn't love this one. Honestly, the only thing I really liked about it is how the look of like the Joker in terms of it was similar to like those 70s, 80s action figures that you mm-hmm. could get. But I mean, I like I like his hat, but I didn't love the story. But mm-hmm. I'm gl- but yeah, I'm glad that I got to read what could be Denny O'Neill's last uh, last story. Yeah. Brendan? I'm kind of glad you led with that because I didn't want to, I I feel bad that if this is Danny O'Neill's last story, I didn't love it really either. Like the artwork was cool. And I kind of liked how the, um, like the Joker's outfit is um, a bit of a nod to death in the family. Um, But yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't love it, which is a shame if it is his last story. I mean, yeah. do you think do you think that the uh, camera and the uh, kind of tropical shirt was a nod to Killing Joke? Sorry, kill. I said yeah. death in the family. I yeah. meant to say Killing Joke. Yeah, no, that that's what I meant. Yeah, Brendan, I, this I is a Batman. Co- this is a Batman podcast. Sorry, get your shit together. <laughs> um, no, that's I. Yeah, I. I honestly, we're all on the same page here. I want to love this one because of the talent involved. I love Denny O'Neill. I love Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. I love them. And I wanted to love this story, but the story is just a little off center. It's a little weird. And I just, I don't love the idea of like the Joker joining the Peace Corps just to kill everybody. Like it's not, yeah, it's not my favorite place or <clears throat> set of circumstances for him. So yeah, like I appreciate the art. I like the talents involved, but yeah, it's, it's not my favorite, which is a shame because I wanted to love it. Yeah. All right. Well, good. At least we can all feel bad about it together. <laughs> I just didn't want to go first because I didn't want to. Yeah. You don't want to shit on Denny O'Neill. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? God rest his soul. I all know. Right, um, all right. The next one is the War Within. This one is uh, written by Peter Tomasi, uh, artist and color by Simone Bianchi, and letterer by Rob Lee. Um, and this one. God, I don't even know what's going on in this one. It's Thank like God, another one where you've said that first because I this one, yeah, lost. I have completely. no idea. I read it twice, and then like when I reread it, I read it again. I was like, I I'm trying to understand what the hell this is, and I can't understand it. So like, it seems like Batman is like breaking into this 
like the Joker, like in a museum, put a Joker smile on a whale. And so like Batman is like breaking into this museum to go after the Joker. And there's like, you know, there's like Jack in the boxes and stuff. And it's like, it's almost like Alice in Wonderland, like weird fun house doors and stuff and minions and like all these weird visions of the Joker, including like, like, and like, yeah, like these weird little dolls, almost like the Dark Knight Returns. Um, but like Batman's kind of fighting his way through all of this. And it seems like to get to the Joker. And then at the end, Batman like is the Joker, but he's like Medusa. He's got like snakes for hair. I don't understand it. I'm confused, guys. Help me. I, I, I can't help you there. Yeah, I got nothing. I didn't like the story. I didn't like the art. This did nothing for me. The I thought it was more, it, it looked like more like it was a painting. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I was going to say. I actually like the art because it's very unique. It's very different. So I liked it. I just could, not only could I not hook into the story, I still don't know what the hell it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah like, it's very, it's, it's very, it's, it's very high concept. Yeah. Because, like, yeah, it, it, it's, it almost seems like the idea is that, like, the Joker is pretending he's Batman to, like, understand Batman. But then, like, is this all in his head? Is this just him just imagining what it would be if he was Batman? I don't, I don't know. Nope. Well, great. This one is one of my least favorites because I don't get it. All right, well, I think terrific. We're all on the same page. Terrific. I'm glad, <laughs> glad we agree. Uh, away we go. Um, next one is The Last Smile. This one written by Paul Dini. We love him. Um, artist by Riley Rosmo. Colors by Ivan Posentia. And letters by Darren Bennett. So um, this one, uh, it is Harley talking about when she was with the Joker. So it was like, it's in the past. Um, where the Joker used to always have this same nightmare and would tell Harley about it. And basically his nightmare was about him being on death row. Like he was getting up for execution and how he had this all planned out. Um, it's one of my favorite moments where he gets his last meal and he orders a pie just so he can <laughs> throw the pie in the priest's face. And he says something, he goes, I waited my whole life for that ga gag, worth it. Which I think is awesome. Like, that's just so great. <laughs> His last meal, he just wants to throw a pie in the face of a priest. Um, but yeah, basically, like, he is, the whole prison is rioting while he's taking his final walk to, to, to get uh, the electric chair. All these people have shown up to watch him die. He gives this horrible speech about, and just be, you know, a total unrepentant bastard to the very end, just making everyone mad, being like, yep, yeah, you know. I'm getting put to death, but it's worth it because I got to kill all the people you love. It's all good. Um, but when he actually uh, sits down and he's going to get electrocuted, he sees Batman, and Batman is laughing at him as he gets electrocuted, which is like his big fear. That's what bothers him. And so then we, we go to the present. We see that Harley is telling this to Poison Ivy, and... Poison Ivy's like, oh, wow, that's crazy. But like, so is that why you stayed with him for so long? And Harley's like, well, that's why I left him. And po Poison Ivy's like, well, why? And she goes, because he had this dream every night and I was never even a part of it. Because it goes to what we all know. The Joker's true love is Batman. It's not Harley. It's not Punchline. It's Batman. And so anyway, that is this one. What do you think of this one, Jim? I really liked it. I especially like how the dream was structured, having, you know, Joker get excited. It's like, you know, you came, that longing, like, you, you do care about me, and then just goes into a maniacal laughing from from Brett, from Batman. Honestly, I expected, once he got to the chair, that, you know, he was going to get away, like the Christmas song says. <laughs> but you're right, it does point out that how much Batman is truly loved by the Joker and it kind of fits the character arc over the last couple of years of Harley leaving him. And you, you know, you see her and Ivy talking in a, in a bar and it's like, you know, this is this. And you obviously see why, how, why they're so close together as well. So I, I really liked this one. This one was a good read. And plus it was Paul Dini. So I kind of expected some, it would be good going in. Mm -hmm. uh, what about you, Brendan? Loved it. I mean, it's Paul Dini, so you've got me from the get-go. But 
honestly, my only complaint, and I know it's subjective, but I, I didn't like the art. Mm. Um, I would have preferred, if, you know, if Danny had it teamed up with, say, Dustin Newen again, who he did his detective run with, um, or even if they, they kind of set it more in the style of the animated series, like the, the Batman Adventures comics and stuff, because... Um, Again, you know, not wanting to give away too much of the Catwoman one, but there's literally a comic, there's a story in that one set in the 66 universe. So, like, yeah, I would have liked to have potentially, you know, I would have loved to have liked the art more so I could really, really give it full marks. But the, in terms of the story, I mean, it's Deanie's. I've never seen the man do any wrong, in my opinion. So, and again, it, it was lovely too how it, it was very much a Joker story, but he was able to bring it back to his Harley, mm-hmm. which I thought was cool, you mm-hmm. know, because that's, he's arguably had the biggest impact on the character of the Joker in the last 30 years with the, with the creation of Harley. So, um, yeah, it, it, I think this is probably my favorite of the book in terms of just the story. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you guys. I, the, I agree with you, Brendan. The art isn't my favorite, but I appreciate it for what it is because it is very unique. It's very different. It's still very animated, even though it's not the same style as the animated series. So for a one-off like this, I appreciate it. I love the idea of the Joker on death row. And for him, that walk to the electric chair is like a victory lap. Like for him, it's a celebration, which is awesome and to me that's like so joker i love that um and then realizing that oh batman gets the last laugh is the nightmare part of it is awesome too so yeah i think the story is great the art not my favorite but i appreciate it in its own unique style um so yeah i agree with you guys i really like this one too i thought it was cool all right onward the next one is birthday bugs um so this one is about bugs bunny having a birthday party Oh, wait, no, that's not it. Okay, Birthday Bugs. This one was written by Tom Taylor, art and colors by Eduardo Risso, and letters by Clem Robbins. Um, So, we got a little kid. He is sitting out in front of his house, and it's his birthday, and he is pulling the legs off of bugs and keeping them in a box. We find out that this kid is one of the Joker's, uh, one of the Joker's minions' kid. So the Joker is coming to see his dad, and he sees the kid instead, and the kid thinks that the Joker is there as a clown for his birthday party, Um, and so he kind of says to the Joker, like, oh yeah, you know, the party's already going on, but nobody showed up, but hey, I'm glad you're here, you know, now I've got a clown, and the Joker is looking at him pulling these legs off the bugs, and the Joker appreciates that about him, Um, and he says something really profound where he goes, oh, you know, do you kill them? And the little boy goes, only if they try to get away, because if you kill them, then you can't play with them anymore. And the Joker's like, I like it. You're wise beyond your years. That is true. So the Joker goes through the neighborhood and threatens the lives of everyone who has kids that they're coming to this birthday party and they're going to be the best birthday party guests ever. They're going to wrap up their favorite toys. They're going to laugh at all his jokes. They're going to have the best birthday party ever. So yeah, the Joker forces all these people to come to the birthday party. Uh, and then the dad shows up, and the Joker's like, I'm going to go have a talk with you. And so apparently we find out that the night before there was like a big job. This guy was supposed to be there. He didn't show up. So the Joker was there to teach him a lesson, um, and he thinks that maybe this guy sold him out. But he said, your son said something that really works for me, which is if you kill him, you can't play with them anymore. So just like the kid was pulling the legs off the bugs, the Joker... Uh, he pulls, well, he doesn't pull, he chops off the fingers of this guy, but leaves him alive. So he says, yep, he's just removing small bits of the animal the same way the sun was. And so they have the big old party and the little boy gives the bugs to the Joker. And he's like, you're giving me your torture bugs. Oh my God. Thank you. Um, and he said, and I will only kill them if they try to get out of the box looking at the dad. So birthday bugs, Brendan. Loved it. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I've got to give, you know, props to the Aussie, Tom Taylor. Um, he does, he's a great comic writer and this was, this was really, really cool. Um, weirdly enough, I could, I could picture this story ha- 
happening in the animated series. Like, I can really picture Hamill's Joker doing this and Hamill's Joker delivering the line, mm-hmm. like the lines. Um, the art in this one, I didn't mind. I didn't really like the style of the Joker. Um, yeah. Yeah, like, with the, I mean, I, obviously I know the Painted on Smiles become more of a, a thing since Ledger, but yeah, I, I didn't really like his aesthetic, but overall the art was good, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed it, and, and for the fact that, like I said, I can really hear Hamill's Joker delivering this, and I can picture him coming across, I think maybe too, because of the, you know, with the birthday party, that probably helps too, but it very much seems like the sort of thing that Hamill's Joker would do. And I could, you know, that last line of him, you know, and I promise I'll only kill them if they get out of the box. I can, I can so hear Hamill's Joker delivering that and giving that sort of little chuckle as he walked off and then fading to black for the Mm. end credits. So yeah, this was a cool one. Nice. Jim, what about you? Where do you stand? Yeah, I I really liked the story. I liked, it was kind of sweet in a way between Joker and the kid (laughs) in a weird kind of way, but yeah, the artwork, this is not for me. It's not, you know, great. Granted, you know, I, I can barely draw my own own name or draw my own face or whatever you want to call it. But still, like, you know, it's just not what I would like to see. And I agree with Brendan about the, the painted on face. Like, and eh, I didn't really like it. But story and is what matters here. And you're right. I did kind of imagine Hamill voy- Hamill's voice when I was reading a couple of these stories. So, yeah, I, I totally get that. Yeah, I think, yeah, we're all on the same page here. Is uh, I love the story, but the art I'm not as big a fan of, especially the look of the Joker. I just, I don't really like the way he looks in this, but I love the, just the the parallels of, of the bugs in the box and then what the Joker does with his people. I think that was brilliant and so well thought out and the way they put it together is is really well done. And I love the idea of the Joker <laughs> making the kid's birthday party the best ever while at the same time, keeping his father living in fear and threatening to murder him. Like, amazing. So yeah, this is a great one. All right, next one. Where is the info? This one is No Heroes. Yeah, it's at the end. No Heroes, uh, written by Eduardo Medeiros and Rafael Albuquerque, artist Rafael Albuquerque, and the colors by Marcelo Mayola, and letters by Steve Wan. And so uh, this one, we find out that like the Joker and his guys, they're, um, you know, they're breaking in and they're robbing this bank. And there's a guy who's an intern uh, who's working in accounting and he sees all this going down and he tries to jump in and be a hero and help everybody. So he grabs the fire extinguisher and he tries to, to take these guys down and he does manage to get at least one of them. Um, but there's just too many clowns and so that they get him too. And so the Joker is like, what, what are you doing? You know what? Like, I appreciate heroes. I got a soft spot for heroes, but why are you trying to help these people? What are you doing? And the guy's like, well, I'm, I'm tr- you know, I'm doing it for the people. And he's like, you don't care. You know, this bank doesn't care about you. Why do you care about this bank? I'd understand if it was your family, but like these people. And so he's like, oh, you're still young. You're still idealistic. You still think that heroes are worth something. And he's like, and I appreciate that, but come on, like grow up kid. Um, and he's like, but I've got a crush. I got a crush on heroes because uh, eventually they turn into martyrs. And so he, you think he's going to kill the kid, but instead he kills everyone else. And he's like, all right, well, best of luck. I'll check on you again in the future. So Joker kills everyone except the guy who tried to be a hero. And that's why it's no heroes. So um, I'm trying to think of who went first the last time. I think Brennan went first last time. So Jim, what do you think of this one? It was fine. Uh, I liked the way it was told. Um, you know, I, I agree that, you know, Joker does like, does like heroes so that maybe he can have that uh, martyr aspect of it. But, you know, it's something that was, you know, fine. I read it once and I didn't think I needed to read it again, you know? Yeah. Brendan? Um, I liked it. I, I thought it was cool. It was, you know, a very Joker thing to do with the twist at the end. It was actually kind of ve- a very um, Ledger Joker thing to do, I thought, um, with blowing everyone else away. I, I actually really liked the artwork in this one. But again, the aesthetic of the Joker kind of let me down. Um, I didn't didn't like his look at all. But, yeah, really, 
it's better than some of the other ones, but not the best of the book. But I, I liked it. Yeah, yeah. I'm I, I'm kind of where Jim is, which is it was fine. You know, I felt like it didn't stand out one way or the other. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. It was all right. It was kind of interesting, but it was pretty short. There wasn't a lot to it. Um, but yeah, it it still feels directly in line with the Joker because you never know what he's gonna do. You know, he might kill you. He might kiss you. He might do both. Um, and so yeah, like the idea of yeah, he he. Take, almost takes a liking to this kid who tried to play hero and he's kind of working it out as to what he wants to do with him. And he's like, ah, oh, what the hell? I'll give you another shot, but I'll kill everybody else. And so, yeah, I like that it speaks to the unpredictability of him, but it's just, to me, it was like, it wasn't deep enough to get super into it, but it was all right. Um, I agree with Brendan that the art is really good, but yeah, the Joker himself, I don't love the look that they went with here, but yeah, it was okay. All right, next one up is Penance. Uh, this one is written and art by Tony S. Daniel, colors by uh, Timu Mori, and color or in letters by Carlos Mangual. So this is one of those classic, like, uh, confessional stories that you see in movies all the time. So there's this guy, he's in confession, and he tells a story about how, uh, you know, He's like a crime boss, and uh, he killed one of the Joker's guys or something, and he ended up with this golden medallion. He assumes the Joker is after this medallion, and so the Joker starts killing his crime family until there's only two of them left. Um, and so he's having dreams that he's Batman, going after the Joker, uh, and he keeps getting better and better, but he's like, oh, the Joker really wants this medallion. i got to figure out what he wants with it, but he's like, I'm going to use it as bait bring the Joker in and I'm going to kill him. So I just want, you know, I essentially want the church's forgiveness or permission to do this. And it turns out that the priest is the Joker. He jumps through, he kills this guy, uh, and he walks away. And if I'm reading it correctly, he had no interest in the medallion. It was literally just this guy, you know, because this guy went after his guy, he's going to take out his whole family is the way I read it. So, yeah, what did you think of this one, Brendan? I, I liked it again. It was kind of a, a middle-of-the-road one, um, like the last one. But I, I will say, like, I, I, I knew that the twist was coming. Like, the way yeah. he's doing the confession, I'm like, yeah, the joke is going to be the priest. Right. So even though it was a, a twist I saw coming, I still liked it. Um, but no, it was, it was enjoyable. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim, what about you? Yeah, the uh, priest part was slightly telegraphed. I don't know why. Maybe somebody just picked up on a little bit early. But yeah, I, I liked having the uh, the crime boss kind of having that uh, those dreams of Batman in the suit. Because I, I had to go back the second time I read it. I was like, why was Batman so fat? I'm like, oh, it was a dream. That's what it was. So yeah, it was. Uh, it was. I liked it. I kind of liked having you know Joker next to the church. I mean, like, yeah, I didn't care about this. I just wanted to kill you. Very mm. Joker-like. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you guys. I, it was one that, yeah, like, it's it, almost as soon as it started, you were like, oh, okay, one of these guys is the Joker. I, you know, the, you knew there was there was more to it. But I like the idea of, like, oh, the Joker's after this one thing. And then, no, he doesn't give a shit. I think that has nothing to do with what, what's going on here. So, yeah, it was all right. Uh, it's another one that I thought was fine. But, yeah, it didn't really stand out greatly one way or the other. All right, and then the final one, right? Final one is Two Fell Into the Hornet's Nest, written by Brian Azzarello, art by Lee Bermejo, and letters by Jared Fletcher. Um, this one almost feels like a spiritual sequel to the Azzarello Bermejo Joker graphic novel because it's the same style, but like not quite as photorealistic, but it's like a little more cartoony version of the style that they did in the Joker graphic novel. And it's like meant to look very retro, you know, like old school, kind of like Dick Tracy almost like from like the 30s and 40s, like a comic strip from the 30s and 40s because the way the colors are and the way that they it looks like it's almost printed on old paper and Poison Ivy looks like, you know, Lana Turner. And so like it's it's interesting. It's sort of this weird retro -y thing, but it's a takeoff of, of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, and it's like the Joker is in Arkham with all these... Uh, with all the rest of the rogues gallery 
and there's you know there's essentially a nurse ratchet from from cuckoo's nest and the joker's you know going crazy and he's he's seeing batman and he's causing trouble and eventually he gets taken in for a lobotomy um and so even after he's been lobotomized he is seeing batman and he eventually there's like a statue of superman he uses the statue throws it out the window and escapes kind of like how uh what happens in cuckoo's nest so that is what is it two flew into hornet's nest two two fell into the hornet's nest so yeah jim what'd you think of this one um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the title pretty much gave it away what the um, what the story was going to be. I really liked how the art was done, kind of that that pulpy and uh, aspect of it. Uh, you know, I think it it was enjoyable. It's not my favorite one, but it was still you know a, a good solid you know good solid read. All right, Brendan. Um, like I've seen one through over the one flew over the cuckoo's nest before, and I I got the the references and everything, but. I don't know. I, I was a little bit disappointed with it, given the um, like the work that these two have done with Joker before. Like, I love the artwork. Um, you know, there's there's a reason why I made sure I got the Bermejo cover um, for this this book. But yeah, I don't know. I just I didn't didn't love the story as much as I would have liked to have. Yeah, I agree. Like, I I love the new spin on the artwork. Actually, I thought it was really cool the way they did sort of like that 30s, 40s comic print look. I thought that was really neat. But yeah, as far as like the takeoff of Cuckoo's Nest, like I just don't feel like it it had anything really good to say. It just felt like almost like it almost felt like a Mad Magazine parody, you know, where it was the Batman characters going through the motions of Cuckoo's Nest. But I don't feel like it really had a point other than that. So yeah, the story just didn't really engage me in a super meaningful way, but I thought that at least the style and the look was kind of cool. So yeah, this one is another sort of middle of the road one for me. Um, yeah, it was okay. So that is the end. That's all 10 stories. Well done guys. So I got to say, what is your favorite and your least favorite Jim? Least favorite is the high concept painting. I can tell you one thing that happened. The war within. Favorite. Yeah. <laughs> favorite is a tie between Scars and the Paul Dini story. Okay. Nice. Uh, Brendan, what about you? Yeah, least favorite is the war within. Um, the Peter J. Tomasi one. It's just too weird for me. Um. Yeah, I, I, I'd have to say my favorite is the Paul Dini one uh, because it's Paul Dini. But in saying that, like, I really love the Kill the Batman one with all the Easter eggs and the um, Birthday Bugs one as well. So if, if I'm allowed, I'm going to give it a three-way tie. But gun to my head, I'd, I'd say Paul Dini. All right. Fine. Um, yeah, I, we're all on the same page <laughs> as far as the worst one is The War Within because, yeah, none of us knew what to make of that. It's just, yeah, weird. I, it didn't work for me at all. Um I think I, yeah, I think my favorite one is probably Scars because it's the one that stayed with me because it's just really creepy. Um, I really like that one, but as far as like just fun, I'd go with Kill the Batman because I and I think that the artwork in Kill the Batman is probably my favorite. It's just really great classic Batman looking artwork. Um, so yeah, I guess well I'll pick a two way tie. I guess um, so yeah. I think we all kind of fell the same. But yeah, again, like the only one I truly didn't like was The War Within. And I was kind of meh on No Heroes, Penance, and Hornet's Nest. So yeah, I guess that's four out of ten that I didn't love. But I think all the other ones I really liked. Well, Dove Core, Middle. So yeah, one that I didn't like, four Middle of the Road, five that I really liked. Yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. That'll do. Well, there you go. Uh, the Joker 80th anniversary. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Pick it up. Definitely worth picking up. Uh, get your favorite cover again digitally. I didn't have a choice. It's just, but fortunately, I love the main cover by Greg Capullo. I think it's a great one. So fortunately, I don't feel bad about it. Um, but good stuff. Great way to celebrate 80 years of the Joker. And yeah, one of these days, uh, another week when we don't know what to do, we'll do the Catwoman one. <laughs> It'll be great. <laughs> um, but... 
we're not just reading comics, we're always watching Batman stuff, and so we did watch the next episode of Batman Beyond. Last time, we talked about Revenant, the return of Willy Watt. And this time, we have another return of a Batman Beyond villain. So I guess we've gotten to that point in the show where now villains are starting to recur. They come back. Um, so this one is called Babel. This is Season 2, Episode 12. It is directed by Kurt Gaeta and written by Stan Berkowitz. This one aired on January 8th in the year 2000. So, uh, what, what to say about Babel? Um, Batman, well, I guess Bruce and Terry, they're in the Batcave. They're working on the Batman Beyond suit. There was a thing, and Bruce is imparting his wisdom to Terry, telling him old stories about, you know, times where he didn't think he would make it, or he might not make it, and Robin saved him. So, yeah, they were just having some downtime. And Ace the Bat Hound freaks out. And it turns out it's not just Ace, but all of the animals in Gotham freak out. Uh, we find out that there is this frequency that it is getting sent out into Gotham, and it is our old pal Shriek. Shriek! Our old pal Shriek. So yeah, the return, I was gonna, <laughs> I couldn't even remember his name. So yeah, Shriek is back. Um, I think the last time we saw him, he lost his hearing, so he's really mad at Batman because he lost his hearing. And so he uses his knowledge of sound and sound waves, and he sends out these things first to anger the animals, but then he sends out the sound waves into Gotham where it affects people's brains and they can't speak anymore. And so they're speaking nonsense to each other, hence Babel, like the Tower of Babel. And so, uh, yeah, he can basically control most of Gotham by not allowing them to communicate. And so everybody's frustrated, everybody's freaked out. And he eventually turns it off. He's like, okay, now you know what I can do. Uh, Batman's got to turn himself in at midnight and if he doesn't, I'm going to do I'm going to do this again, but I'm going to crank it up and it's going to essentially fry all your brains. And so at the beginning of the episode, like the press and the people of Gotham are like, oh, Batman, what a hero. He does all this great stuff. But now that it's them or him, they're like, no, Batman should turn himself in, turn himself in. And so Terry doesn't quite know what to do. So this big, uh, you know, back and forth between. Uh, Bruce and Terry and even uh, Barbara, uh, Commissioner Gordon, about like how to deal with Shriek. And so Terry eventually like scans Gotham and he sees uh, that there is a building that Shriek is using essentially as a giant tuning fork. And that's how he is controlling this these vibrations. And so he goes after Shriek. Uh, they have this big confrontation on the building. The, the building gets destroyed, which means Shriek can no longer send out this, this vibration. Shriek is defeated, and uh, Bruce is like, well, Terry, if you hadn't figured it out, would you have turned yourself in? And they just leave it up in the air. And so that is Babel. So, Jim, what did you think of this one? Uh, I liked it. Full disclosure, I was not a, I was a late watcher to uh, Batman Beyond. Some of the episodes I haven't seen at all, so I had very little uh, knowledge going in. But for the most part, I liked it. Um, I liked how Shriek used, you know, their own. I guess voice vibrations against him to the point where Terry and Bruce or everyone else had no idea what was going on. There was very, uh, I like the idea of lack of communication or loss of communication, if you will. And, you know, the citizens being okay with the sacrifice of Batman seems a little bit close to what's going on in the world right now, but I'll leave that, uh, <laughs> leave that alone. But yeah, I, I really uh, liked how um, the episode played out. All right, Brendan, where are you? I didn't mind this one. I got to be honest. Um, again, I, you know, I, I, the, the villains in this series never do much for me anyway, but it was, it was enjoyable. Um, while I was watching it, particularly with the finale, I was just like, Whoa, glad they got this one out when they did. And not a year later, because it would have probably had to be pulled. Oh um, yeah. I'm curious to know actually this might've been pulled from rotation after yeah. 2001 because it does climax with two towers falling down um but yeah I, it was it was an enjoyable episode I, I didn't dislike it like i have some of the other ones yeah i didn't even think about that but you're right um 
So I really like this one too. It was it was one of those where when it began, uh, I wasn't sure if I was gonna like it because I was like, oh no, is like the evil plan just to make the animals crazy? Like, oh, that's not too interesting. But I liked that that was just really a precursor of what was to come. And much like the last episode where they took Willie Watt from the first season and they used what we already knew about him, but twisted it and gave him new things to do. So it wasn't just a rehash. Um, they did the same thing here with Shriek is that, you know, we already know he's a master of sound. What else can he do with that to cause trouble for Batman and for Gotham? And I like that they came up with something new and different and unique and something that almost felt too big for Batman. Like, how do you fight that? Um, it just was a nice big challenge for Terry. I also really like the conversations between Terry and Bruce in this. I think that that's when the show is at its best is when we've got Terry and Bruce working this out together. And I think we got quite a bit of it in this episode. So I really liked that about it too. So yeah, I thought this was a really strong episode because it was a way it, it brought back a, a, a villain from that they'd introduced previously, did something new with him, expanded him and made him just more of a recurring threat to Batman. So I liked it. That was good. And we hadn't seen Barbara in a while, so it was nice to see her again. Mm. Um, all right. Well, uh, a letter grade for Babel, Jim. I go solid C plus. Oh, <laughs> OK. Uh, what about you, Brandon? Yeah, I, I was going to give it a B. All right. I was going to give it a B plus. So there you go. So C plus B and a B plus for Babel. Uh, very cool. All right. So the next one up next time is Terry's friend dates a robot. That's a heck of a title. Usually these titles are one word, but that one is literally Terry's friend dates a robot. So, okay, great. Um, that's your homework for next time. As we continue. Gee, on I wonder what that one's about. Um, I, who knows? Um, all I know is that there is there is an episode of Futurama where Fry dates a robot. So I'm wondering how close these two are going to be. The, the title is very. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Mm, yeah, but this one it's a story by Paul Dini, so maybe you'll like it, Brendan. Who knows? Hopefully, we shall see. All right, so that's next time. But we're not ready to say goodbye just yet because, as always, we've got to crack open the Wayne Manor mailbox. You've got mail. Maybe temporary. She wrote a letter. You are one hell of a messenger. This is all Master Wayne. All right, first email here is from our old pal, Tom Fallows. It says, hey guys, I'm loving the podcast as always. My question, uh, do you think we'll ever see a proper ad adaptation of Robin on film? The last time we had one was in 1997, and since then we've just been teased. Personally, I'd love a live-action version of Robin's Reckoning. With Brenton Thwaites and Curran Walters on Titans, do you think this may make people more open to Robin on film? Thanks again, Tom Fallows from Liverpool. Um, thank you, Tom. First of all, I wouldn't even say that 1997 was a proper adaptation. It just was an adaptation. Um, so I don't know. What, what do you think, Brendan? Do you think that uh, we'll ever see a proper Robin in the movies? Christ, I hope so. Like, we've talked about this so many times, and it's something we desperately want. Like, I mean, I want the whole Bat family done well. But it's got to start with Robin. It, it's it's time. You know, we've had two iterations of Batman now on the big screen that, that haven't mentioned... I mean, well, I can't say I haven't mentioned Robin. I mean, you know, you had the suit in the cave in, in BVS and... <sighs> I'm not even going to include John Blake because he's not Robin. Um, even though I do kind of understand what they were going for there. Um yeah, it, it's well beyond time. We we need to we need to have some Robin action going on. Whether they use Dick Grayson or go straight for Tim Drake, I you know it's got to be one of those two in my opinion. So the sooner the better, I mm. think. Yep, Jim. What about you? I, I wonder if Warner Brothers is scared to touch Robin, and I say that because you know they backed out of Marlon Wayans during the Burton films. Chris O'Donnell was that and John Blake was just seemed like an Easter egg. So I'm like, what, what's, what's the 
problem, what's the issue that you have with, with Robin? It doesn't matter if it's Grayson, Drake, Todd, Kerry Kelly. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's just like, what's, where's the issue? Why, why haven't this, why hasn't this happened properly yet? Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's bizarre to me. Um, I do think we will get it. I do. It just takes the, the filmmaker who wants to do it. I think that's more about the specific filmmakers is like Tim Burton. He just, he wasn't that interested in Robin. And as much as I love him, I'll disagree with him on that. But yeah, he, he said it himself. He's like, I just, I just couldn't get into Robin and I felt like I needed to do it because he's part of the mythology. But you know, I figured, oh, I'll wait one more. And so he just wasn't, he was doing it because he felt like he had to do it. Um, Chris Nolan didn't, was, had no interest in Robin, you know, to the point where he just created a new character as a, as a nod to Robin without being Robin. Um, and so far it seems like Matt Reeves doesn't really want to do Robin yet either. Hopefully he will want to in, in future installments, but I certainly don't expect it in the first film. But to the point of this email, Titans shows that you can do Robin, you know, like, and you can do it and take it seriously. So I hope that, yeah, they look at that and they go, see, you can do Robin and nobody's laughing at it and you just buy it. There's no reason you can't do that in a movie. And yeah, I do think it will happen eventually. It's just a matter of, of the right movie doing it. Um, all right. Next message here is from our old pal, Carrie Vanderberg. It says, Hey, I hope you're all doing well, staying safe and enjoying the summer. I've got a couple questions. Number one. <laughs> oh, oh, Carrie. Uh, he says, if, and if is in caps, if it was announced during fandom that Ben Affleck was to come back to do Batman on HBO max. And if they announced that Jeffrey Dean Morgan would be Thomas Wayne's Batman in flashpoint, which two of the following projects would you be most excited about? Matt Reeves is the Batman, the Ben Affleck Batman series, Flashpoint Batman, or Michael Keaton Batman? Mine would be Ben Affleck Batman and Flashpoint Batman. Number two, I need some advice on how to organize a scare -thon. How do you guys do it? Do you just make a random list going by theme, style, era, and setting? Um, what if not all of the items on your list aren't on streaming? Do you just rent a bunch on Amazon? I'm not a horror guy, but I've been slowly broadening my boundaries with the genre. One of my caveats is that I tend to hold on to is that for me to enjoy a horror film, I prefer it to be some kind of story of redemption. If evil wins, then I feel like it wasn't really worth it. So any advice you could offer would be appreciated. All right. Thanks, Carrie. I'm, I love that it's July, but you're already planning for Halloween. <laughs> That's my boy. That's what I'm saying. Um, as you should be. Um, okay, so first thing. Let's just say all four of these things are real things, and you can pick two. Matt Reeves is the Batman, Ben Affleck, a Batman series on HBO Max, Jeffrey Dean Morgan as a Flashpoint Batman, or Michael Keaton returning as Batman. Those are your four options. Pick two, Jim. Affleck and Keaton. All right. Brendan? Oh, God. It's a Sophie's choice. Um... Definitely Affleck. I'm leaning towards the HBO series just because, um, you know, I'd love to have, similar with the Gotham show, like I'd love to have something to tide me over between movies. Um, yeah, okay, screw it. I'm going to go with HBO and Affleck. Those are the same thing. Oh, so I thought it was Affleck movie and HBO series. Sorry. No, it was Affleck's, I, I... Affleck's Batman doing... An HBO series. Oh, okay. Well, easy. In that case, then, yeah, Affleck and Keaton. All right. We'll make it three. Perfect. Um, all right. So as for question about Scarathon, I do wish Jamie was here because I know he has, he has thoughts about this. Um, but he usually will put Rob Zombie movies in, and you don't want that. So don't do that. <laughs> and so it's good that Jamie's here. Never mind. I take it back. Jamie, I'm glad you're not here. I don't miss you at all. I'm just kidding. I miss you. Okay. Um, but if you want stories of redemption, don't watch anything that Rob Zombie makes. Um, okay. So as far as like, like I don't really organize a list. I, do, I just sort of take it as it comes. Is like, I have my favorites that I watch yearly, like John Carpenter's Halloween and Dead Silence and Insidious. And like, there are certain ones that like are annual watches for me. Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. Like that... I want to watch every Halloween season. And so I always make sure to watch those and then filling in the gaps. It's really just what haven't I watched in a while? 
What am I in the mood to watch tonight? Um, what's something I've been meaning to watch but now fits into Scarathon? And so I, I sort of fill in the gaps with all of that just depending on my mood. Because, yeah, it can be whatever you want it to be. And also, at least for those of us who do the Scarathon, we're flexible in our in our definition. So, like, I watch Hocus Pocus every year. I count it as part of my Scarathon. And if you're not a big horror fan, I think you'll be okay with Hocus Pocus. I don't think it'll give you nightmares. Um, so, like, anything that's sort of Halloween spooky themed, I also watch Paranorman every year, and I make that part of my Scarathon. And then I watch, you know, again, John Carpenter's... I, I watch a few of the Halloween films, usually. I don't usually get through all of them. Um, but, yeah, like, really, just... It's whatever interests you. It's whatever you've been meaning to watch, whatever you love watching, uh, whatever people have recommended to you. We're happy to give you recommendations. And, yeah, you go, you go from there. Um Brendan is someone we have hooked into Scarathon over the past few years. <laughs> yeah, you have. So how do you make your choices? Similar to you in that I have the few that I want to watch every year, so I kind of pepper them through. Um, I'll always try and keep Halloween till either the very last or towards the end. Mm -hmm. um, last year on Halloween night, I did back-to-back, um, -back, I did Halloween the original followed by the 2018 version, nice. uh, which is the first time I'd done them as a back-to-back -back thing. Um, a lot of it, honestly, is seeing stuff that you guys have posted and going, oh, shit, I might check that out, um, which is essentially how the whole thing started. But that sort of seems to be a thing every year which sort of broadens my horizons a little bit. But, um, yeah, I, I at least try and watch Halloween, H2O... Oh, sorry, Halloween... Halloween H2O and now the 2018 mm -hmm. as far as the Halloween movies go. Um, I'll probably put the Conjuring movies in there as a yearly thing because I watched them for the first time last year and loved them. Oh, they're so good. Uh, at least Scream 1 and 2 usually makes an appearance in there. Um, so, again, too, like if you're not a big scary movie fan, um, I think things like, like Happy Death Day you know, it's where it's sort of more the, it's not so much about the, the you know, the slasher part of it. It's kind of more the premise. Um, I also usually throw um, Batman versus Dracula in there. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, good. Every year. So, and I think the first year I did it too, I might have even watched the, um, oh, is it, what was the Batman and the Monster? Mech Monster Mech Mayhem. Monsters yeah. Or... Batman Unlimited yeah. Monster Mayhem. Yeah, I, I watched that one year as well. Because, I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of in there. And I'm sure this year we'll both be watching that, that Scooby-Doo movie that we talked about. Damn right. A week or two ago. So. Yeah. Yeah, just, just do it as it comes. Don't put too much thought into it. Yeah, um, as long as it's spooky-themed, yeah. like, go for it, you know? like Ghostbusters, shit like that. Yeah, anything. Yeah. Adam's Family, like, that, you know, that can count. Um, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's whatever you're in the mood for, but it works. But, yeah. We, we can definitely give more recommendations if you want it. And if Matt Reeves' The Batman is truly set at Halloween, then that can become part of Scarathon. Yeah. Um, Jim, I don't know. Do you participate in Scarathon during October? I, I do not. I basically turn on Freeform 31 Days of Halloween and just let it go from there. Okay. <laughs> But, yeah, I mean, kudos to Brendan for bringing up uh, Happy Death Day because I was pleasantly surprised about that. I thought that was actually pretty, a pretty solid movie. Yeah, I agree. Um, I also just play um, Everybody Backstreet's Back constantly because that's a <laughs> Halloween song. Right, right. So, cool. Yeah, I basically leave up to – I'll leave it up to free form just to make my choices for me. Well, there you go. That works. Um, cool. All right. Well, moving on. Next one is from Carl Fuston uh, or Fuston. I don't know how you say it. But anyway, he says, hey, do you think that the reason Christopher Nolan made his Dark Knight trilogy in the real world is because of the reaction to Batman and Robin? Um, thanks, Carl. Uh, what do you think, Jim? Do you think that's why the Dark Knight trilogy is more real world? Absolutely. There's no day glow neon paint at all. Uh, Brendan, what do you, what about you? Um, I don't know if it's a direct, I mean, the, the reboot is a direct reaction to Batman and Robin. Um, I, I think it's just cause that's what Nolan wanted to do. Like that was his end to the character. Like he wanted to make it real world and he did. So yeah, 
Yes, but not directly, as I think the question alludes to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I I agree with that. I don't think he went. I don't think. I don't think anybody said Batman and Robin was too cartoony, so you'd better go real world. I think it was more like, hey, we're looking at a fresh start for Batman. What could that look like? And a bunch of filmmakers said, well, here's how I see it. Here's how I see it. How here's how I see it. And Christopher Nolan, his sensibilities went, well, I want to do it as if it's set in the real world. And they probably did say, well, yeah, that's certainly a very different approach than what we just did with Batman and Robin. So great, let's do that. But I just don't think there was like an edict. I think it was, it was a couple of different factors. Um, yep. all, all right, next message is from Aaron Kajanto. He says, hey, first time emailer. Oh, welcome, Aaron. Hi. He says, one Batman story I'd like to see tackled in the movies is Red Hood. So far in live action films, Batman has faced the rogues that are bent on either total destruction or utter chaos. But I believe that Jason Todd Red Hood arc would offer viewers something completely different. Something they've yet to see in a Batman film. One where Batman's actions within his personal inner sanctum has some serious consequences. Under the Red Hood is still my favorite DC animation and Rocksteady handled the Jason Todd story nicely in the video game. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, stay safe and keep up the good work. All right, Aaron. Well, thank you for finally emailing us. Good to hear from you. Um, what do you think, Brendan? Red Hood as a movie. This is a tough one because similar, like, and I think you're kind of up there as well, Andy. Like, that's still my favorite of the, especially the Batman mm-hmm. um, animated DC movies that we've had. Um, it also holds a special place in my heart because it, it brought us together. Um, I, I, I like the comic as well. But I think, I think to do it live action would be hard because it requires the general audience either needing to know the history of Jason Todd and it kind of be something that happened off screen and we just jump into it knowing that, that there's a dead Robin or it's something that they build to over an arc of movies. Um but with all that said, and I know you're of the same opinion with this, Andy, Jason Todd works better when he's dead. Mm-hmm. Um, I, 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 and again, I said that as someone who loves the Under the Red Hood story and the movie, the animated movie. So I know I'm sort of talking out of both sides of my mouth here, but um, I, I prefer the impact the character has when he's not around. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, as much as I'd, I'd personally like to see that animated movie done in live action sure yeah i would but i just think logistically it's too hard and i i don't think they should do it yeah i think we both have always spoken out of both sides of our mouth when it comes to that because we we agree we're like yeah jason todd's better when he's dead but somehow that animated movie is still great and so I agree with you as far as the live action film is like, yeah, could it work and be really interesting and different? Yeah, absolutely. You just have to jump in midstream and go, oh yeah, there used to be Robin. He's dead now. Like do it as the prologue. Um, And then, yeah. So like you, you could do it and it could be really cool. I, you know, there are other stories I'd like to see done first, but I'd still probably be into it. Jim, what do you think? I'm kind of in the same boat. I would like to see it. I don't know if Warner Brothers has the patience to tell the entire story. So I'm glad you mentioned the prologue, maybe kind of like in the Incredible Hulk style where you see that entire origin in a span of what, like two and a half minutes. But I think that with Jason Todd, it's, uh, it's, a, little, it's a little difficult just because you're right. Like he does work better when he's not there. <laughs> yeah. um so yeah i mean it could be done of course i would immediately go but then at the same time like eh, you know it's not something i'm dying to see at the same time but i understand for those people who love that story and love that character why you would want to see it i totally get it um moving on next message is from mary joe it says hey i'd like your thoughts on tim burton saying that he likes batman returns more than batman 89 since he was able to make the movie he wanted to make with returns unlike 89 uh where the studio had to tell him how to make the movie and what needs to be in the movie also what are your top three burton films outside of batman uh thanks mary joe um i i don't know if this is from a new interview or something i don't know where this is coming from but like 
I mean, I've heard similar things, I guess, is, is yeah, like, I mean, we all pretty much know that, like, Tim Burton was given creative freedom on the second movie because the first one was such a hit, but the first one, yeah, there were much stricter guide rails because he was a young director, he hadn't had a hit of that size yet, so I kind of get the impression, but uh, what do you think about this, Jim? Yeah, I mean, I think that was the movie he wanted to make with black goo and all, but we all know that, you know, you need to sell McDonald's toys. Um in regards to my, you know, favorite um, Burton films outside of, outside of Batman, I go Beetlejuice, Nightmare, and Edward Scissorhands. All right, Brendan, thought. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he says that, and and the reason being is is even in the question. Like he, that was the movie he he, he got. He wanted to make that movie, and he did. He had no studio interference, uh, you know, for better or for worse, and that's. I can totally understand why he would think that because it's very much a Tim Burton movie and, and not a Batman movie. Um, I mean, sorry, it's more a Tim Burton movie than a Batman movie. It, it is still very much a Batman movie. I said that wrong. Um, three Burton movies. Just trying to think like, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm not a Burton fan, but I also don't really seek out his movies either. Um, like I, I, I like Sleepy Hollow. I thought it was good. Um, I've seen Big Fish once and remember liking it. Um, and it's been forever since I've seen Edward Scissorhands. Uh, may, maybe Beetlejuice. Actually, yeah, I'd, I'd say probably Beetlejuice, Sleepy Hollow and Big Fish just because they're the ones that I can remember watching. <laughs> um, all right. So, I mean, yeah, like... As far as him liking Batman Returns more, I understand it. Because, yeah, he was given the keys of the kingdom and he got to do whatever he wanted. So who wouldn't like that more? Um, and then, yeah, top three Burton films. It is, uh, for me, it's Edward Scissorhands, easily, uh, with a bullet. That's just one of my favorite films, period. Um, so definitely my favorite Tim Burton film. Um, Edward Scissorhands, uh, Big Fish, I agree with that. I think it's beautiful and amazing and magical and emotional and it's oh, so good. Um, and then the third, I would say Sleepy Hollow, because speaking of um, Scarathon, I always watch Sleepy Hollow during Scarathon because it is just seeping with Halloween vibes. I love it. I kind of forgot that he didn't actually direct Nightmare, so I want to change mine to Pee Wee's Big Adventure. All right. Also a good choice. Yeah, I was I was letting Nightmare slide because he did write it and he did design it and he produced it. So I'm like, OK, I like. But yes, technically, he did not direct it. But I was willing to let you have it. But that's fine. Pee-wee is also an amazing choice. Um, next message is from Jacob Klimoski. It says, hey, I pretty recently discovered your show and I'm enjoying it. As soon as new episodes pop up, so do I. Thank you for your hard work and dedication. <laughs> um, Phrasing? I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> is there a pun in there? Yeah, maybe. If there, is, if there is, I like it. All right. Um, he says, in Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, did you notice that when Jon Stewart got spoilers in 3, 2, 1, roasted, I don't think it's a spoiler at this point, it's fine, um, his ring just sat there and didn't go off to find anyone new. Do you think it was because there were so few left? What was your take? Uh, thanks, hope you're doing well. Stay safe, Jacob. Thanks, Jacob. Um, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, well, I think it's because the battery was broken, and so the battery couldn't power the rings to go find anyone new, right? Wasn't the battery destroyed? From memory, yeah. I think? I haven't rewatched it since we did that episode, but that's my guess. <laughs> I could be wrong, but that's my guess. Yeah? yeah Thoughts? I can't really add anything. I'd, I'd just be, yeah, I'm, I'm the same as you. I, okay. I'd need to rewatch it to be. Yeah, because I feel like when he was, like, crawling to the battery, he got destroyed with the battery. Right? I think. Anyway. I think so. Anyway. That's my, that's my memory of it, so that would be my guess. Is like, yeah, without the battery, the ring can't go find someone else. Um, maybe I'm wrong. All right, next message is from CJ Higgins. It says, hey, when you finish Batman Beyond, I highly recommend The Brave and the Bold. I'm currently going through it with my three-year-old son, and he likes it. He turns four in August. The show is pretty great, and it's really all about the other DC characters in the universe, and Batman is also there. Season two is where the stories get more in-depth. I love it, and any DC fan would, too. Your bat friend, CJ Higgins. Um, hi, CJ, and 
Duh. Like, when we chose Batman Beyond, that Brave and the Bold, I think, came in second. Like, it was an option because I love it. And we've talked about it quite a few times on the show is how much we love it. It's great, yeah. For people who who missed that the first time, definitely watch it on DC Universe because it is amazing. Um, Jim, do you watch Brave and the Bold? I've seen a few episodes, not in not in the entire run of eps- of the show, but yeah, like I think the voice cast is it's actually quite fantastic with John DiMaggio, Jeff Bennett, and Dietrich Bader. But yeah, I mean everything I've seen, I've enjoyed it. Oh yeah, it's it's so good, Brendan. We're doing the Batman. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't I, know, I, man. I, Maybe I like we're not. Brave... <laughs> I like Brave and the Bold. Um, I, I genuinely do. But I don't know. I kind of feel like since we went from, you know, Batman the Animated Series to Batman Beyond, it's kind of the next Batman series in line. Um, if we're talking strictly Batman, you know, without going into the mm. Justice League stuff. Mm. Um, you're, yeah. using, that, you're using my... OCD and things being orderly <laughs> against me, and I don't I'm like. Just using, it. I'm using logic, is what I'm using. Mm. <laughs> it would just seem weird to skip one and then go straight to Brave and the Bold. I'm not against doing Brave and the Bold. Obviously, um, I'm biased towards the Batman because I I think it needs um, a bit more love than what Brave and the Bold does. I think people tend to go, yeah, Batman the animated series is great, and then Brave and the Bold was really great. They kind of skip over the Batman and. It's always been my mission to to give that series some more love because it's awesome. Um, so that that's what I think. I think we'll get to Brave and the Bold one day, but I, I would like to do the Batman first, if I have any say in that. Well, you want to do that? Start your own damn podcast. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm fine with that too. We'll see. But anyway, for the yeah, for those who haven't watched the Brave and the Bold. Don't miss it. It's great. And I did I did grow to appreciate the Batman as well. Um, all right, next message is from Willis Orr. It says, hey, Bat family, uh, when do you think I'll g- we will get our first look at Colin Farrell as the Penguin, Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman, and Paul Dano as the Riddler? Also, will you do a special RF for RM episode of either Dick Tracy's 30th anniversary or Battlefield Earth's 20th anniversary? <laughs> Oh, man, Willis. Okay, well, thank you for the message. Um, Dick Tracy's 30th anniversary, I think, is actually a good idea. I think that that's not a, you know, that that could work. Um, I don't want to watch Battlefield Earth again. I saw it one time, and that was enough. I don't know if I'm up for it. Um, But it could be funny. I could drink. Um, (laughs) Recommendations are noted. Thank you, Willis. But anyway, as far as when are we going to see our... uh, villains for the batman uh what do you think jim well now that they're shooting indoors or at least on you know uh bigger practical sets and studios i have a feeling the paparazzi photos like we got with uh whatever the sequence was in the in the cemetery i think the chances of seeing those have d- diminished because it's probably a close set and there's not probably gonna be anyone in there just snapping a quick cell phone pitch and, and dipping out so if if we see it, it's going to be in a in an official capacity. That said, I'd probably say I don't know a year before the release date. All right. What do you think, Brandon? The fan in me says in about a month's time <laughs> is when I'd love to see them. Yeah. Um, at fandom, that that I think would be cool. We get the internet talking and. It would, it would, you know, make us fans happy because we've, we've seen, well, I say we've seen the bat suit, but in terms of official releases, we've only seen that little teaser and the, the, you know, sort of um, obscure shot with the Batmobile. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see official looks at, at Pattinson in the bat suit, let alone, you know, the the Rogues Gallery and stuff. So hopefully at fandom. Um, as far as a Dick Tracy 30th anniversary, I can't believe we didn't think of that. Um, that's, that's a really cool idea. I'm so down for that because I don't know, it, the last couple of months, it, it seems to have been brought up a lot, um, in backcast emails and stuff. So it would be cool to cover it, um, with using the vehicle of the RF show as opposed to, you know, Batman, which it has nothing to do with. So, mm-hmm. and I haven't watched it for a couple of years and I, I do enjoy that movie. So I'd, I'd be down for, for doing that on RF big time. Count me in. All right. What about Battlefield Earth? I've never seen it and have no interest in seeing it. 
All right, so we're going to do Battle for the Earth, everybody. We just decided. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, I would love to get the reveals in fandom. Um, that would be great. But as Jim said, now that they're going indoors, like hopefully our first looks will be official first looks instead of the set photos that we got of, uh, you know, of Batman on a bike. So whenever we get it, at least hopefully it'll be something that is officially released and it'll be the best possible first look. So we shall see. It'd be not, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if we at least got like Catwoman next month, you know, something cause they've got to reveal something. Um, all right, next message is from Jonathan Mercado. It says, Greetings, Bat Family. First off, I wanted to thank you for doing the commentary track on Batman Forever. I feel it may I feel I may have lit the fire about it from my last email. Sorry, Andy and Jamie, but it was very entertaining to hear Andy get drunk. Ha <laughs> um, ha. Says, I wanted to ask if you had heard that Val Kilmer released a book of memoirs. I recently finished it and I loved it. Kilmer wrote a chapter on Batman Forever. I thought it was interesting to know that Kilmer originally was supposed to do three films that didn't happen. Uh, he wanted to read the script before accepting the role, but he didn't due to pressure from his agent. He praised Schumacher for his kindness and charm to strangers and family members, even during the high pressure of the production. He did go on to say that when he turned down the other Batman films due to his commitment of The Saint, uh, he was asked to do Heat with De Niro and Pacino, which was in pre-production while shooting Batman, which resulted in Schumacher not being happy or inclined to speak favorably about me to the press, but I had to take the Heat. I'm happy you guys did the commentary track of the film. I could... I could share the same love of the film with Brendan because that was my Batmania as a kid. Plus, I saw the film many times with my grandmother in theaters and on VHS because she loved Jim Carrey. Sorry for the email. I just wanted to share Kilmer's memoirs and wanted to know your thoughts. P.S. My wife Kaylee loves Disorder and we're currently watching the Disney films in order. We're up to Brother Bear. All you guys are a part of our family in more ways than one. Thanks, stay safe, and we'll be listening. Um, thanks, Jonathan. I appreciate that. So, um, thank you. I didn't know. Like, I didn't know Val Kilmer had a book out. But is that why he did that interview with the New York Times? Maybe was he promoting the book? Maybe. I, I don't know. Did you know about the book, Brandon? No. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, I don't know if I'd read the whole thing, but I'm definitely keen to read the chapter on Batman. Yeah. Um, to get his take on it, but yeah. Um. I'll just say this, like, there have always been two sides to that story, and Kilmer is sticking with his side of the story, which is, oh, no, everything was fine. I just took the saint, and they didn't want to wait for me. So that's always been his version, um, and so it sounds like that's the version he put in the book, and now Joel has passed away, so he, can, he can't tell his version anymore. But, um, yeah, that's always sort of been what he has said. Um, but, yeah, who knows what the truth is. I want to hear Chris... I want to hear Chris O'Donnell's version. I want to hear a, a neutral party's version of it. But, um, mm. I don't know. Brendan, what do you think? Yeah, agreed. Um, it, it's, a, it's a hard one. Like, I... It, it kind of always bugged me, even though Batman and Robin I, I didn't like. It's always bugged me for continuity's sake that we had three Batman in four movies. Um, but, yeah, it would be interesting to hear, like, a no holes barred story of what actually went down um mm. there i think that'd be really interesting um like i said i didn't know that book existed but i'd i wouldn't mind checking it out if only for that for that batman chapter um i think that'd be really cool and um i also appreciate the the mutual love for batman forever nice i i will say this though um looking at their track records though i am more inclined to believe joel schumacher i guess i'll say that because, yeah, I can understand because that there are stories from every movie that Val Kilmer has been in about him being a problem. And you can only yeah. hear it so many times, you know, like, like if it was only about Batman forever, you'd go, okay, well who knows? But like, there are 20 years of stories of Val Kilmer being a problem. So I've never heard a story about Joel Schumacher being a problem. Um, <laughs> So, for what it's worth. Joe Schumacher was very welcoming if he believed the stories that have come out. <laughs> That's true. He was so accommodating to so many people. <laughs> so many people. <laughs> so many people. And I say, get it, girl. Um, uh, Jim, thoughts on this? I mean, yeah, I, I'd give it a shot. I mean, I 
I kind of had an opportunity to meet him in 2019 at at, at Atlanta Comic Con, but I opted to meet Kevin Conroy instead. I think you chose one. So yeah, that's good. I oh, think look, I did I'm, too. You know how I feel about Batman Forever, and I'd I'd make that call as well if it was between Kilmer and Conroy. But I have met Kilmer um, at a convention here, and he was lovely. He was really nice. Yeah, awesome. Um, all right, onward. Next one is from Eddie Bolton. It says, hey, um, uh, oh, he says, um, my girlfriend of two years and I broke up uh, in the last week or so, so it's been a really rough time, and all the RF for RM podcasts have been a lovely distraction, so thank you for that. Uh, my question is, have, any, uh, have you guys any Batman-related stuff you watch when you need comfort? Any particular animated series episode or other Batman films that tick the comfort box? Thanks for the much-needed distraction, Eddie. Eddie, thank you so much. Um, and first of all, sorry, sorry. Going through a breakup, never fun, always tough, but just know you will get through it. Uh, this, this too shall pass. Um, but as far as comforting Batman content, um, Brendan, anything? I think, I, honestly, Batman the Animated Series in general, um, I could just, you know, I can chuck any random disc in, press play, and just lay there and be happy watching it. You know, it's it makes me happy. It's it's my favorite version of the character. Um, I know it's not technically um, Batman, but Wonder Woman is has been my happy place as far as superhero stuff goes since that movie was released three years ago. Um I adore that movie. It's so much fun. But, yeah, if, if you want specific Batman, I, I, I can't think of anything better than Batman the Animated Series. Just start at the beginning and go all the way through. Mm-hmm. Jim, what about you? Yeah, I, I second the Animated Series. Uh, my personal favorite episode is Joker's Favor. I'll throw that on. And you're right, just let it play <laughs> after. One. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, honestly, I just did a recent rewatch of... BBS and Justice League and honestly I will throw on forever at any given point in time just because it's actually not as bad as a lot of people say so I want to give make sure Brendan heard that <laughs> oh, I see you welcome back anytime <laughs> <sighs> nope it's worse um, <laughs> you know it's funny because I was thinking I was like oh like Batman comfort food I was like yeah probably like the two Burton films for me would be comforting because you know I was a kid when they came out, so there's something comforting about that. And I was like, I was like, but I've put on the Schumacher films as like comfort food too, and I've put on the Dark Knight trilogy as comfort food. So my answer is almost it almost all works for me as far as that's concerned. Like I can put on almost any Batman content and like just appreciate it as something comforting. Uh, I agree with you guys, animated series, but like yeah, I could put on Brave and the Bold or like. Oh, I don't know. Batman just, I guess, has that effect on me in general. So that's not helpful. I'm sorry, but it almost all works. So I guess what I would say is pick your favorite. Pick the thing that gives you the, the warm, fuzzy feelings and, and use that, whatever it might be. All right, next message here is from James. It says, hey, guys, I'm James. I'm from uh, UK, South Wales. I'm a big fan of the podcast, and I always can't wait for the next episode. I've even listened to every episode and then download previous episodes while I wait for new ones. Uh, I just recently listened to your review of the BVS Extended Edition, uh, and I thought it'd be a great episode to do a watch-along, as you did for Batman 89 and Man of Steel. I love BVS. It's my favorite comic book movie. Thanks for everything you do. You make my workday go so much easier listening. Long live the Batcast. Oh, thank you, James. Uh, that's very nice. I appreciate that. And as far as, like, a commentary, yeah, of course. We're, we're down. Um, next year is five years, so maybe that's a good excuse for it. It'd be cool to do in the lead up to the Snyder Cut too, actually. Oh, that's true too. Two birds, two birds, one stone. Because yeah. they're both. I mean, it comes out in 2019, so it might not be around the anniversary, but it'd be a nice lead in. It comes out in 2019. It comes out last year. Oh, sorry, Christ, I, I don't it's know amazing. what's going. On. Sorry, it's it's the numbers, dude. With all the, <laughs> you know what I've been. Going I through, know it's fine. Me, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. Like, once we get the release date for Zack Snyder's Justice League, you're right. Like, let's back it up from there and do a commentary leading up to that. And it'll be hopefully close to the, the five-year anniversary. Five years, yeah. Cool. All right, one last one here. It's Stuart from Guernsey. It says, hey, um, 
This one's for Jamie, I guess. It says, I'm with Jamie. Deceased is my favorite Elseworlds story. I love the world that Tom Taylor is building. I just wanted to let you know there are other books that are connected to it. DC is putting out digital every two weeks, uh, which are 99 cents each and are brilliant. Um, and says, Brendan, have you checked out Batman The Adventures Continue? I'm curious to hear your thoughts as the original comic series is your all-time favorite. You guys should discuss it on the show. Anyway, hope you're doing well. Stuart. Uh, thanks, Stuart. Um, so uh, Jamie's not here, but um, I know I've been reading The Adventures Continue. How about you, Brandon? Uh, I read the first couple. I have slacked off um, lately with just other things that have been going on. Plus, um, because of the, um, the the Batman thing that we did in May with the recommendations of the Batman novels, um, I've, I've tracked down two of those that we talked about and have been reading them as well. So I, I've... I've got them downloaded on my tablet. I just, I think I've read maybe the first three issues, um, but I do, I do want to um, catch up. And has it finished its run yet, or is it still going? No, there was a new one that just came out a couple of days ago. I feel like, which I have not read yet, okay. but but I've been reading it up until then. And I will say, the first couple issues, I was like, eh, but then it got a lot better, and I'm I'm into it. I'm enjoying it. They're really quick yeah, reads, I, though. Yeah, yeah, I'm. I'm up to, I think it's the second issue where Deathstrokes come into it. But again, it's it's been, I'd need to go back and start from the start again. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm kind of at the point now where I think I might just wait till they've all been released, um, and then read them all in one hit like a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. Um, and and yeah, I mean, if it's something you want to cover on the show, I'd definitely be be keen to, um, given that it's sort of return of the animated series. Yeah. But. And, it, and it's one too that when you know, I'm sure it will come out as a trade. Even though I don't really buy trades anymore, I, I will be getting a physical copy of that to to put on my shelf with all my other, um, Batman adventure stuff. Well, does it have an end, or is it ongoing? I thought it was just a, a mini series when it was announced. I mean, because it's still going now. So yeah, I was I was unclear. I thought that it was just it just kept going. Because right now oh. I'm looking at it right now. There have been eight issues so far. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, I'll, I'll need to get on it then. <laughs> like I, said, I, I, I enjoyed it, especially once Deathstroke popped up. I enjoyed it a lot uh, and it's been really cool. So it's, yeah, I'm like, if it does end, then you're right. Like I'd be fine with doing an episode sort of looking back at it, but it looks like looking at my, because I have my iPad right here. Cause we were talking about the Joker thing. Um, looks like I am three issues behind. So I read the first five and I need to read the next three. Okay. I was sure when they announced that it, it was it was a, a mini series, but I could be wrong. Look, I'd love for it to. I mean, to we'll keep see. Going. We'll. I mean, we'll. What, as soon as I stop getting new issues, maybe that means it's over. <laughs> um, Jim, have you been reading this, or yeah, have you been keeping up with this? I haven't because I was under the impression that it was supposed to be like a mini series, and I was honestly just going to wait to get the trade and just plow through it then. But if it's because I, I want to say like I remember reading it, it was supposed to be like maybe ten issues. And so if it's update, I'm like, oh, I'll just wait. Yeah, I mean, and maybe that's true because I, I honestly don't even remember what they said at that time. So it's true. It could maybe it's ten, maybe it's twelve. But I mean, regardless. I'm just looking at Wikipedia now, and it says DC's June 2020 solicitations indicated that the miniseries has been extended from six to seven issues. But I have but if eight. You say that you've got eight. I've got eight. But yeah, it's definitely extended from what it was originally announced because I thought it was only six issues. Hmm. Interesting. Which is the length of a trade. Yeah. I mean, they'll still release a trade. You know, they'll they'll find an endpoint and release that as a trade, even if it keeps going. But yeah, like I said, I looking at it right now, I got eight of them. Yeah. Oh well, like the the more the better, in my yeah. opinion. All right. Cool. Well. Awesome. That's it for the Wayne Manor Mailbox. We're closing it up. Uh, if you've got a message or a question for us, you can send that to holybatcast at rf4rm.com. Um, that's where we're going to wrap this baby up. Uh, this is another little bit of this, a little bit of that. A little news, a little Joker, a little Batman Beyond, of course, some emails. It's been fun. And Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. I'm very happy to be here. It was uh, fantastic. Yeah, it was great having you. And uh, tell our friends where they can find you online. You can find me on the inter internet on Twitter at Jim Scroggs. That's S C R O G G S. On Instagram, J H Scroggs, S C R O G G S. And if anyone out there wants a sports podcast uh, to listen to that's centered around Atlanta sports 
And in the southeast, I co-host the Sports Porch. We are on Sound SoundCloud and iTunes. And if anyone on iTunes sees the one with sees one with two different names of that title, we are the one with the peach and the logo. The Sports Porch. All right. I will listen to the episode when you tell the story about eating Cracker Jacks with Michael Keaton while watching the Atlanta Braves. Good luck finding that one. No. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to search. Um, no, it's great having you. Thank you again so much. And yeah, thank you for all your support, uh, of all the year, over the years. Appreciate it. Uh, Brendan, thank you as well for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk Batman. Not a problem. Anytime. Well, you great. know that. Yeah. And, um, yeah, if, you don't need me to prompt, prompt me anymore. If, um, if the listeners want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at Lowy007. Um, you can find my podcast, The Nightlight, um, on Twitter at nightlightpod, um, facebook.com slash the nightlight, and the nightlight.podbean.com. Awesome. Um, so there you go. Give Jim and Brendan a follow, and thank you as always for joining us on Holy Batcast. Thanks for downloading the show. Please do subscribe so you never miss an episode. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And as Michael Keaton's Batman says, I want you to tell all your friends about me. Visit HolyBatCast.com, find Holy Batcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And again, any messages for the Wayne Manor mailbox, you can send those to HolyBatCast at RF4RM.com. Uh, but that'll do it for this episode. On behalf of Jim and Brendan, I've been Andy. We'll see you next time. Same bat time, same bat channel. Batcast is brought to you by real fans for real movies. Remember, the thoughts and opinions shared by the participants are theirs and theirs alone, and do not represent the companies or organizations they happen to work for. He's never been this late before. There's a certain rhythm to these things. I cause trouble, he shows up. We have some laughs and the game starts all over again. Only now, thanks to you, I have this terrible feeling he's really not coming. Without Batman, crime has no punchline. <laughs> <laughs>